Start recording. Ready to start recording. Here we are. We are for Saturday of the boost. We're going to call this week one. Uh, we'll call week zero May the 4th. We did, in case you were just joining us, we did do a kind of a kickoff on, was it Thursday? Thursday, right? And we went through why, the motivation, all that stuff. And I'm just outlining this in a, a file called the Pages file. It's for something called Make Docs. It's kind of our outline. So uh, all of this stuff you can go get at skillstack.io, S-K-I-L-S-T-A-K.io, where we'll be updating it. I'm not going to be updating it live there, but it that's where it will eventually be updated when you want to get any kind of written content. Uh, a couple uh, administrative notes about the Discord. So if you if you do exclamation point chat, uh, uh, bleh, exclamation point Discord in the chat, you can go go there. It's also in the, you know there's links in the about and YouTube and all that. Um, I did create a single category called Boost, and I got rid of all the other uh, channels, and I created two channels within the Boost category. One of them is. Uh, beginner boost, no, boost chat, I renamed them boost chat 2023 and boost chat 2022. Someone made a really good point about, um, some people are doing the boost from 2022 and they want a place to talk about that. And that's fine because I don't think we're going to be, I mean, I'll keep them around, but I only have so many channels I can use. Um, so I don't want to, you know, blow my quota on, on, on that on discord. Um, so, but I w it does make sense to have the two there because some of you may actually want to go do the 22, 22 boost uh, while you're also doing this one. I, I'm not going to, you decide what to do. Um, obviously, I think the 2022, three stuff is going to be the most relevant for you, but um, it's not all there. And some people are really anxious. They want to move ahead. So they're not going to be the same content. Largely, I mean, about 90% the same content, but you know. So just know that. Then we have to, I have to do it every year. I'm not going to talk about that over. I did talked about that in the video before. I hope everybody watched the Aaron Schwartz video. Uh, the internet's own boy, you know, props out to Aaron Schwartz. We're going to do this in, uh, in his name and we're going to learn about the tools for managing and, and really using, um, modern information tools. Some of the best tools from the modern information age, uh, that were used actually by Aaron Schwartz to do many amazing things to instigate change in our world and uh, and that you can use for to to you know bring about change in your life however you want to do it. So let's get into it. Um, we only I, I, we're going to take a we're going to take a ten minute break at the top of the hour. So that will be uh, you know what is it you know in an hour or so at a twelve o'clock noon my time. So we're going to try to get as much as we can done in that time. And I'm going to go very quickly. I'm not going to be answering a lot of questions in the chat so that I don't get distracted. I tend to get distracted. And so I'm just telling you what's going on. And here's what I plan to cover today. So we're going to cover how to start taking notes. You might think you know. And I'm going to suggest another way for you to start considering how to take notes. Uh, this inevitably dovetails into a conversation about the best note-taking strategies and stuff like that. We're not going to do any of that. I'm going to tell you my suggested way to do this right away. And then if, because you have to have some way to take, you know, digital notes that you can kind of go to later, uh, that will build into something better later, possibly your own website with a blog or a Zettelcast and all that stuff. But, but right now we just got to boost you, which means we're just going to take, get the very, very basics. Okay. Uh, we're going to go quickly through how to install a terminal. Obviously I'm not going to be installing a terminal. Um, some of the, I mean, I've said before, I like to do these things with you. Some of these things are just not practical for me to do it again because I've already done it. And it's, I mean, it really, it's like a couple clicks and you're there, right? So we're going to go through how to do that. Um, and we've already talked about installing Pub and desktop. We talked about that. Hopefully you'll all have that done by today. If you don't have that done, go to the chat and discord and start asking questions about what you're stuck on. We're not going to cover problems here that's going to be something we'll cover through the discord unless it's something everybody's got going on and hopefully by the end of the day today uh we will get done uh installing ubuntu linux and i very specifically put ubuntu linux in there i do not want to tangent into a fight about the best linux distro there's plenty of other places to do that we're not doing that today we have made a decision we're going to install ubuntu server into a Podman Linux container, uh, and that's it. Okay, so if you want to do anything else besides that and you want to debate that, fine. Please have fun in the Discord doing that. Please use the thread if you're going to do that so you're not, you know, annoying everybody else. 
And um, if you'd like to like discuss the, the subtleties of all these different things, which inevitably, you know, there's like three things that always, you know, tangent us. Uh, discussions about the best Linux distro, uh, discussions about what the best language to learn is, and, you know, politics and religion. <laughs> so we're going to try to avoid those things this year. But if you do want to talk about it, that's fine. Just don't do it in a place that's inappropriate, right? So so I'm going to try to stay on, on point here because we only got two hours. And I am ending after those two hours because I have stuff to do. All right. So let's get going. Uh, start taking notes. Now, th there's really only one thing to know here, okay? Um, and I'm going to actually take some skeleton notes myself here so you can see what I'm doing. I am using VI. You're going to be learning all of this stuff, too. Uh, to edit a readme file that's got a .md extension for Markdown. So you're already getting kind of a, a sense of this, right? Uh, taking uh, notes. And I'm going to use title case for this. All right, so we got to say, um, okay, learn. Uh, let's see, we're going to put create a GitHub account. Uh, okay, and then we're going to um, create a... Uh, a repo on github and then we're gonna do I'm making these I, I could do these as numbers should we do these numbers Nah, these are gonna show up as numbers in the topical guide so we'll just do that way <laughs> so create a repo on github then we're gonna create um, uh, create uh, one or more markdown files uh, so okay and this is kind of a hard one because, uh, you know, I was going to make get marked on its own thing, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay, I'm going to stay fast here. Uh, learn markdown basics, not the whole thing. We're just gonna learn the basics and create one or more markdown files, uh, using the graphic interface using, uh, GitHub, uh, web interface. I know you're like, but this is about the terminal. I know. Okay. You don't know the terminal yet. So we're going to learn it this way first. Okay. And and then you can have someplace to take your notes and you'll be really annoyed by the web interface the whole time. And then you'll learn, you'll be like learning the terminal. You're like, oh my God, I'm so happy I'm on the terminal now. All right. So that's really it for taking notes. All right. Uh, and, and you know, the, we're not even going to get into how to organize your notes right now. Okay. Uh, we will talk about the best way to manage your knowledge and notes and stuff like that. Uh, I should probably put here private repo and, uh, and okay. So, <laughs> all right, you guys ready? So let's do this. So let's go over what GitHub is really quickly. Um, and you know, what is GitHub and why do you care? Uh, let's do that. So what is github and why do you care do i care all right so again this is a boost which means i'm giving you the summary of the stuff and then you can fill in the gaps right if you want more details so we're going to go out to github.com all right if you have i mean by now you've probably heard about it right if you haven't heard about it you're kind of living under a rock or you haven't been involved with it either way you need to learn about github right now when you come to github it's not going to look like this it's going to be like a new account. You know, it's going to say, you need to join GitHub, right? Should we go through the GitHub joining process? We probably should do that. Can I do that in a deleted account before? I think I've done that before. I, I used to do that all the time. W one of the things I used to do, I mean, I, have, I must have so many of these things built. So let's do that. Let's do, um, I, I, I use, no, you don't want any of that stuff. Let's do... I forgot how to do this. I need to update my Chrome. I'm so bad. I could do new incognito window. Okay, so let's do... Now it doesn't know who I am. And I'll go to GitHub.com, just like you, okay? You don't think I really need to do it. Okay, so... I know you guys don't think I need to, but I. But, you, but there are people who don't know, okay? Uh, sort of sign up for GitHub. You need an email address. If you don't have an email, I, it, I'm going through the same things I used to do when I was in a, a skill stack. And there are a lot of, sometimes it'd be like, you know, 10 year olds who've never had an email address. I had to talk to her mom about it. By the way, if you're under 12, 
you need your parents' permission or have them build it. And even then, GitHub is, is, is kind of weird about that. So, you know, don't go blabbing around everywhere that you are under 12. Um, a long time ago, somebody had their account removed because they put their kid under 12 on GitHub. Uh, that was like 15 years ago, so I don't know. You sign up for GitHub, you get, a, you get, you get this thing here. And may I suggest a couple things about this, right? The only thing I really, recommendation I really have here is um, I'm going to suggest uh, uh, create a consistent permanent name. And this, uh, did I say that right? There we go. Um, what do I mean by that? So I'm just going to say a few words about this, but it's super important. Now, you you know that I'm RWX Rob, right? And and I have skill stack, right? So you probably already have like a gaming handle or something like that. Uh, and so I'm going to put here, uh, use a, a name you can create. How about this? Create a good name. Uh, use uh, something you won't be ashamed of in your 30s <laughs> okay don't pick you know creeper 9000 or something like that just don't do that it's a bad idea i mean we've had people do that right i've had i've had it so I'm, I'm just saying it to you make sure you tell somebody about this right so i'm suggesting using lowercase and that is going to make your life so much easier spoiler alert um, <laughs> there's some great name suggestions in the chat right now. If you're in our Twitch, you can see them. You can't see them otherwise. Um, I turned chat off, right? This chat's not on the screen, is it? Okay, good. Anyway, so, so use lowercase. Uh, it, it's, it's easier, uh, to type and remember for people. Um, you know, it's seriously, it is. Um, I'm going to say something else. Uh, try to use the same, uh, they call them a handle, uh, that you use elsewhere. So if you don't have Twitter, maybe you do, maybe you have Mastodon, maybe you have whatever you have. If you're already into tech and you've already got these things, Facebook, um, pick a name now. And I'm going to say this, um, consider, uh, this is just a consideration. Consider not using your real name. Uh, and, and that's just, there are many people who do use your name and they would argue against this. Okay. So there are a lot of people that think that you should use, like in my case, Rob.Muelstein, right? Nobody can spell my last name, period. So, uh, as, uh, if complicated, I mean, it does give you user recognition and, you know, by you and all that stuff, but you know, and it's not like you're going to be anonymous, especially on GitHub. You don't want to be anonymous. You want people to find you so they can give you a job. So um consider you know not using your name if it's complicated um i mean that's up to you and then what was there's another thing i used to tell people um what was it that that's pretty much it i, I mean if i remember it, i'll go back and edit but i mean just just you know use something you know use something simple uh um simple and memorable you know because people are gonna this is your brand okay um, uh, this is your brand and, and I know that's stupid. I, I, I am going to go there. Okay. I'm going to do the whole social media branding thing for a second, but it matters. All right. You, you can hate it all you want. I definitely do. But if you want to influence others to give you a job or just because you want to contribute to the world, you're going to have to do a certain percentage of marketing. Your ideas, the things that you make, your FOSS projects. And by the way, I'm horrible at this. I, I know it might not seem like it because you're watching a YouTube video from me or something. But but I, when I was Mohax, which is my my second life persona for years, I did a really good job at that. But this, not so much, right? So with the tech stuff. Um, but what I'm trying to tell you is that you have to be aware of that. So when you're asking about these identifiers, there's actually a website you can go out there that will show you the different, um, the different versions. 
uh, yeah, I, 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 it's the second life thing is a story for another day. You're gonna have to ask me. I have lots of stories about that. Uh, very good experience, actually, overall. So, um, but the but the branding of your name is is actually important, and you do want to start managing your social media stuff. We're gonna get into this ad nauseum when we at the end of the boost, pretty much when we talk about getting a job, landing a job. Uh, building a professional learning network, marketing yourself, all of these things to get a job, right? So that stuff does come into play right now because you're picking a name. Now, if you pick the wrong name, don't panic. You can still change your name on GitHub. But if this, since you're just creating an account, nobody knows about you yet, right? And you're just going to have a private repo. They're really not going to know about you. So it's not, if you make a mistake and you decide you want to change it by the end of the boost, that's fine. Don't, don't sweat it too much. But I did want you to give that a little thought up front. Okay, so, um, all right, so once you have an account created, and you should probably, if you want to pause the video right now and go do that, that's fine. If you have any questions, go ask them in the Dosco right now, and we'll help you out. But once you get a, an account created, you'll get, um, you know, you'll have a feed here. It probably won't be as, as active and populated as mine is. And you can spend a certain amount of time customizing your profile and everything. We're not going to go over any of that right now because we're going to do that when we we do the, the thing I talked about at the end of the boost, right? So particularly, a little, little, little preview, you, there is a special repo that is the same name as your name. So mine is Artibix Rob. If you go there, this is a very, very special repo. And anything you put in this repo, see it sells, it even said this is a special repo, right? So this is your special repo and this repo becomes your personal landing page when people go to see you. So like when this is me seeing me, here's my, my gnome thing, you got your little status here. And you know you can use this as as a web page. In fact, we're gonna. I, tell, I told you we're gonna come back to this. Okay, we're gonna talk about how to make this thing. Why this is even more important than having a website. Okay, uh, and and then you can see down here you get your little you get your little uh, contributions. So you can see I've been very not busy lately because I've been doing uh, biking and stuff. Uh, if you want to sponsor me, by the way, you can come on in here. That's how I prefer to be. Um, uh, uh, whatever financially compensated because it gives you credit in fact i, I recognize lots of these people are some of my wonderful sponsors thank you so very much uh, i am sponsoring a few people that i really um like you get these little fun achievements and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've got more stuff to cover um and let's go to with some other stuff it tells you what you've been doing where you're active uh, and it kind of gamifies the whole idea of development. Okay, so so that's where we're gonna go. But for right now, I have 24 repositories. You probably have zero. So you're gonna go ahead and make a repository. Now, this is something I can do with you. Okay, so you go over to this button over here and you click on new repository. Okay, and uh, hopefully I'm not gonna be giving away any information. I don't think I am. All right, so you can actually, if you have, I have multiple organizations, you probably don't. So I don't want to make it from a template. You can do that, right? You can go from a template and copy it. We're not going to do that. And I'm just going to call mine notes, assuming I have a free notes. Damn, I already I already did this. Uh, notes 2023. It doesn't matter because it's private. You can't name it whatever you want, okay? And uh, yeah, and by the way, if, if anybody in the chat wants to share your GitHub, uh, oh, oh, let's take a moment, okay? After, okay, hey. Since you guys are all there, right? Take a moment to go star each other's repos and start out in kind of a fun way, right? Maybe follow each other's repos. Uh, when I taught skill set classes, we would do that. We would take a moment and we would all create our accounts and then we would all go see each other's accounts and we'd all go follow each other. Uh, which is fun because you know you don't have anything in your feed right now and so if you do that you can see that you're all there you can remember who was in the boost with you uh you can like, kind of start your 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 thing in fact let me put a, a note here uh create a good name uh go follow other uh members uh of of the of the boost of this year's boost and then you know it's going to be a great way for you to kind of build your network right already you can say, hey, oh, that person was in the boost. And then you can actually, as soon as they start doing public things, you can say, oh my gosh, look what they're doing. And you can like, that's that's the whole social, you know, aspect of development. This is how you get jobs too. All right. So yes, please, please take a moment. I know there, I don't know how many of them there you, there you are, but um, I mean, you can do this in the discord. You can do it if you want to spam the chat. That's fine. Put your names out there. If you want to do that, go ahead and put your names out there in the chat right now. 
and <laughs> TG. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, somebody's being a smart aleck. Yeah, they're being TJ Holloway Chuck. It's a it's a long it's an inside joke. Uh, but yeah, you know, go do that. Say so, RWX people want another joke. Okay, so I have to show them. TJ Holloway Chuck, the most prominent developer of our time. Some people think he's fake. There's actually videos and then conference talks based on whether TJ is real or not. Uh, this is an example of a very prolific uh, developer. Too prolific, some say. He's a hive mind. Kind of a fun thing. That's somebody put themselves as, as that was their name they posted. So that's the joke. Now you got it. Um, it's kind of an inside joke, too. Thank you for all the sharing. I see some people are using uppercase letters in their names. That's up to you. I'm not a fan of it. Um, all right. So let's move on to the next thing. If you need to pause the video, that's fine. You can continue to post your things as you finish them. Um, you don't need a real... I mean, if you want to put a description here, you can put uh, my notes example from 2023 right and i don't want it to be public so let's take a no let's make a note uh, uh, uh let's make a, a comment about this why public versus private who wants to guess i bet you can guess already so we talked about this on 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 on, Wednesday, on thursday but i'm going to repeat it um uh, your notes your your hello worlds your little teeny projects that are just experimentation unless it very prominently says lab and let me give you an example uh you want it to be not visible to others because it will get picked up in the search results and it will lower your score all of the systems that are out there that evaluate github repos and suggest who should be hired will get the wrong information and i know this exists because i was told by someone who paid for a high dollar price for a service to get these recommendations uh and i i won't name the company but it was it was actually a customer of a company that did that analysis for them and then they hired from it from the reports that it generated so i'm telling you do not clutter up your github with public stuff that's going to dilute what you want people to see about you OK, uh, a lot of people do. They don't know this. And this is something I didn't know until I talked to this person. Actually, it was a, a parent of one of the people I mentored. Um, and so get it slash Rvix Rob. And then I have a, a, a repo called Lab. Uh, as we had new ones over time, uh, learning happens in the lab, not in the lecture hall. This repo contains various different coding, technical lab experiments, exercise exploitations. I refer to these during the beginning. So this this very clearly now this is still going to dilute my AI score, right? Because it's a bunch of like really just one-off stuff and and if you want to take a moment to make a lab right now uh repo at the same time fine but th let's let's just wait you could just call yours notes you could call it boost notes you could call it code book you can call it whatever you want okay but make it private uh let's go ahead and save some time and click on add a readme um uh, and so thank you for the follows and add a readme file we're not going to use a git ignore that that tells it not to save things so secret things and stuff we're not going to put a license on this because nobody's going to see it uh you are creating a private repo in your personal account okay so then we click on create and i mean this it's worth going through this because I, the interface changes somebody told me that the search uh, just changed this week actually on github so it's worth going through this every time uh you named it artifacts rob boost <laughs> okay well that's fine yeah that's good as long as it's private i mean if it's public we don't want to i mean that's another problem everybody puts art rob in their thing and then it's going to show up in the searches too it's not going to be me i mean there's a million ways you can troll people on github if you really wanted so i put the notes here you can you know do all kinds of things you can star stuff or whatever um all right so here let's get into the editing of the file and let's begin the next part so we just created the the private repo uh uh you know why should it be private we talked about that and um and that's it and we went through uh we gave it a name that we could remember uh what else do we need anything else there i don't think so all right so let's get let's jump into markdown basics so uh okay let's put here uh uh create initial uh readme automatically and that just saves you from having to do it, which is a lot of a hassle. So just go ahead and use it. They can be, you're just going to have the one file for your notes right now, but you can, you're going to get really good at managing your notes. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. Um, so here you can see we've got this, we've already got some notes here and there's a little pencil here. 
And the first thing I want to notice is that um, that the um, readme.md is the default uh, uh, displayed uh, for the repo uh, or the repo or uh, folder or directory, whatever you want to call it. There are some people, I'm, call, I'm using both terms for now because you may not know the difference. You, technically, it's a directory, right? So you see how it, it looks like it, it doesn't look like code, right? And that's what that is. See, it's the readme. This is the one that we always use readme.md right now. You can use a whole bunch of different things. I don't even want to mention them because somebody's going to use it. Use readme.md. I promise you, you'll be happier. And there's even different formats that are supported. But we are going to write this in a special look if you don't know markdown at all we're going to spend the next 20 10 20 minutes on markdown but if you don't know anything about markdown you can just use this as a text file right i don't even know what would happen if you renamed it that would be interesting if it, anyway we'll, we'll, somebody can experiment with that so we click on the we click on the pencil and here we go we get our very first look at at markdown which is by the way really horrible markdown because they didn't put a blank line after the first heading which is a sin against met markdown in my opinion even though it's supported by the original um and so you're like oh no what do i have to remember but see look right here you got this preview here and edit right so you don't need to download you know vs code or anything like that to take notes you can just take as long as you got internet access you can take notes right away from here for now now there's a million other ways to take notes and edit files we've talked about that uh, and so you can go ahead and, and do that, right? So my 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 notes not dot to, to 2023. Now it automatically named it after the repo. You can say uh, it doesn't even you don't even have to have a heading. It's like uh, my collection of notes from the 2023 skill stack uh, beginner boost. All right, and let's see what it looks like. Click on preview. Ooh, wow, that's a big long thing there. You know. Uh, this is kind of cool. Look at this. It'll even show you the, the changes you made. I mean, there's just so many neat things here. Um, they they actually, um, you can change the number of tab spaces and indenting and all this. Uh, and you can start writing, right? Um, and, and I am going to give you the, I'm going to go through everything about basic markdown live right now from memory for the most part. Uh, I've written this many, many times, but uh, in fact, uh, I will. It will actually end up here. Um, so I'm just going to bullet point them for right now. As a reminder, I'm going to go back to an older resource that I still have: rwx. Uh, .gg. Don't use this. This is old. It's going to go away. Uh, Lang md. And here's the basic one. So this is this is some old content that I have, but I'm going to use it as a guide, and then I'll we'll move it over in here. Okay. So the the first thing about Markdown is that um, there are lots of resources for Markdown. So what is what is Markdown? Uh, what what is Markdown, and why do I care? All right. I'm going to scream through this. We're using PubMan. No, Docker, PubMan. We're going to get there. I, I, I hope we get there today. We'll see. What is what is Markdown and why do I care? Okay, so uh, you can do that search on the internet. What is Markdown? But I'm going to tell you really quick. Uh, Markdown is a creative writer's answer to HTML. So on any web page, you can go see any web page like this, inspect element, and you can see the HTML. This is HTML, right? And I've written a lot about this. Uh, I think HTML was a massive mistake. I think it was a huge failure. I still think it's a failure, as you can see by all the divs. Uh, and Tim Berners-Lee, and to some degree, who invented the World Wide Web, sort of agrees with that. Markdown was Aaron Schwartz. Yay, Aaron. Remember? Dedicated to Aaron. It was Aaron's and John's answer to a very poorly designed way to capture knowledge on the World Wide Web. And it was, you know, it was leave it to scientists and engineers to overcomplicate things, right? Leave it to the writers and creatives to simplify things. And they said, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm not putting a bunch of, I mean, okay, let me just give you a sense of this. 
All right, so you see this document that I'm writing right now in Markdown? These are notes I'm taking in Markdown, right? Do you want to see what it looks like in HTML? Let me show you the same exact. I'm going to convert this document to HTML. Look how it looks. All right. Here's how it looks in Markdown and HTML. Oops, I didn't do the whole thing. There it is. That's exactly the same set of notes with bullet points in HTML. Which one do you like better? I'm going to rest my case with this. HTML was a massive failure. Same with XML. XML was a massive failure. It led us to a different point. Now we have JSON, right? We have JSON and then we have YAML. Some people still hate YAML, but it doesn't matter. We've, we've, the longer we go, the more simplified our lives become. Even graphic design. We don't use skeuomorphic design anymore. Even our design things are flattened and simple. The, the longer a humans exist, the more they seem to simplify uh, the technology so it can be consumable. So, uh, so this is README. You can read this. You don't even know it's really README. And you can actually render it as text, which I will show you right now. So I can do something like this. I can say, uh, well, no, I can't do it with that one. I, I'll do it with a different one later. Anyway, uh, you can, you know, yeah, bad memories of X well. So, so it, John Gruber and, and uh, Aaron Schwartz, who wanted to just make blogs and stuff and just spend time writing. I mean, a lot of you don't even know you're using it. Did you know you can use it in Discord? By the way, it's one of the biggest differences between Discord and Slack. You can actually put Discord... You can use Markdown and Discord. Well, you can put stars around a thing. Yeah, you can put stars around uh, uh, something and it'll make it into italics. And we're going to get into all that stuff right now. We're going to go really quickly. We have 15 minutes to cover all of Markdown. All right. So you, you might have to pause this. We're not doing anything with Doris today. Uh, some people are asking in the chat about my wife. She was there yesterday. Um, so, so, so let's start. All right. You can already tell uh, some of this. The really great thing about Markdown is just so stinking intuitive, right? And if you want to jump ahead right now and do a search for how do I learn Markdown, you'll probably find this. Uh, uh, was it Markdown something? Markdown. Oh, gosh. Where is it? I don't even have it in my history. Uh, how do I make a log of Markdown? Okay. Okay. Uh, Learning uh, Markdown. We'll just do an internet search for that. Markdown Tutor. Yeah, this is the one. I hate this. All right. I hate this. You know why? Okay. You can go through and do this if you want. But the reason this sucks is because it doesn't do one thing. The whole point of Markdown was to make it simple, right? So I'm going to make, I got to make a case for this. Before we get going, I have to make my case so you can just hear me out, right? Uh, reduce. Uh, all marked down to, and I'm going to put uh, italics around this, one best way. All right. And the, the, the world, uh, uh, this is a popular Python saying, but the world has kind of agreed that if there's one best way to do that, to do something, do it that way. And if you need the variations and alternatives, fine. So what I've done with basic markdown is take the many many possibilities now this is actually kind of the bad thing right so you have on the one hand you have the scientists who made html there's like it turns out to be that there's a lot of ways to do things but they like things more precise right and then you have the artists and the writers and creatives like like aaron uh and and john gruber who are like you know, we want you to be able to express yourself in the source code. And there should be more than one way to do it, but it should be really legible. It's more about it being readable and consumable and giving the writer options, blah, 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 right? And by the way, these are the same differences that some site between Perl and Python. A little side note there. Uh, Perl is written with artistic expression and contextual uh, grammar in mind and python is a one best boring way to do it that everybody learns and knows how to do and makes it much cleaner and easier to 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 read and sustain and maintain long term which is why enterprise has picked up python over pearl uh pearl is better for writing things quickly and expressing yourself python is better for long-term sustainable boring code this these th there's this contention between these two ideas of creative expression and one best way all over the place and i'm going to tell you right now that if you want a job, people who hire other people 
want people to do things simply and consistently. So that means identifying one best thing. And you'll find this out about me. There is usually one best tool for the job, right? And, and I will put my foot down for myself and I'll say, look, this is the best tool for this job right now. Maybe something better is going to come along, but this is the best tool for this job. And here's why, right? So the one best way idea uh, pops up all the time. It'll also save you a ton of time learning things unnecessarily. Let me give you an example. So, so I'm going to jump right down into basic markdown thing. We're going to go through all this right now. I promise we'll make it by 12, but, um, some of these things get a little crazy. So let's jump right ahead and do one. That's kind of fun. So you see this one here, here, uh, let's actually use my, my, uh, pre did I kill it already? Oh, here we go. Okay. So, so look at this. This is how you do a line. Okay. Uh, the following. The following uh, is a line. Or a hor uh, it's actually a horizontal rule or a separator. Okay. And then we preview it and we see, oh, hey, look, there's a line. Right? After the line. And you click on preview. And, you know, you can do this. So there's a line. Okay. You know what else you can do to do a line? In fact, oh, they got rid of it. Oh, no, 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 no. I did it wrong. I think it's, I think it's squiggles. I don't even do it anymore. I can't remember. Is it squiggles? Nope. Do they, they must have shut it down. That makes me happy, actually. Or is it, is it these? Is it, is it stars? I think they might have changed it. That, that would be awesome if they did. I hope they did. And they did. Oh, my God. Anyway, so the original markdown looks like GitHub doesn't allow it anymore. The original markdown allowed any number of different ways to do line separation, right? I think this is one of them. Yeah, that is. See? Uh, I think squiggles are too. Anyway, you don't care. The only thing you want to know is that four dash dashes makes a horizontal separator. That's all you want to know. And let me tell you some reasons why I think you should always use the same thing, specifically four dashes, right? Because if you use four dashes, when you later on, when you want to search through thousands of lines of, of code that is your notes or your, your knowledge base, and you want to find all the horizontal rules, right? If you've artistically expressed yourself with different line lengths and rules and stuff like that, you're, 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 parsing to go find all those things is gonna be much much harder so just trust me on this if you don't want to use my thing fine but pick one best consistent way to use it and use that throughout right uh and and that's just the beginning right so another let me give you another simple example of, of something you should never do so headers can be done like this right headings i should say but they can also be done like this you can put a big old line under it like this and look at that. I mean, the, the code, the whole idea was that the source code would be nice and pretty and fun to read, right? Okay, don't do that. Just don't do that. The parsing algorithm for that is insane. You also can't look for the lines that begin with a, a hashtag to see if you got headers, okay? There's a million reasons not to do that. So I think I've made my case for one best way. Now I'm gonna share with you my best ways to do this. I'm not even gonna talk about the alternatives usually, so I don't confuse you. I already did that enough. And then you can go make your decisions if you wanna add more later, okay? So here, here is a heading. Uh, headings begin with a hashtag, otherwise known as, what's the true name for a hashtag? Anybody actually know? I'm gonna put that out in the chat, see if you guys can figure it out. I'm, I'm doing VI commands in my graphic editor. Whoops. Pound. Mm-hmm. Shebang. Uh-uh. The shebang, there's no bang there. Oglethorpe. That's actually Octothorpe. There we go. Somebody got it. Okay. So this is actually, I think if you, the, the, if you want to be a pedantic jerk, you can call it an Octothorpe. Octo. Octo. Uh, otherwise known as a pound sign. Otherwise known as a hashtag. Otherwise known as that thing that goes like this. Anyway, um, so here's the heading, right? So, and uh, okay, so uh, headings uh, begin with hashtag Octothorps, you know, and you can put one there. 
right? And you can do it here. Now, um, right away, I'm going to teach you something else. When you want to write code inside of your source code, use three backticks. And in this case, it's Markdown. So we're going to put MD here. You're writing your own textbook right now. Yeah, you're writing your own notes that can be published even if you wanted to, right? So heading one and then, uh, and uh, maybe because Octothorpe's and, uh, uh, include a blank line. Just trust me. It's not required. Just Pandoc requires it. include a blank line after the heading, uh, to separate from following paragraph. All right. Okay. So heading, uh, paragraph, uh, heading to whatever, right now let's preview that. Woo. See how pretty tick, tick, toe. <laughs> I don't know what Thorpe is. I don't. So, but you see over here, you can, you can click on this, you get automatically, you'll cut and cut and paste it. You get a bunch of things for free by doing this, right? Um, so there's a heading one, there's a heading two. It's funny that this one didn't get called out as a heading. It's like it was something you need to know about Markdown is that because it is kind of loosey goosey, there's lots of different versions of it. And I, I have kind of netted out the most common versions of it. I have a feeling that's because this is on a different line, but I don't know that. Let's go check. Nope. Damn, that's bad. That's a fail. That's a fail GitHub. Anyway, we're going to get to the whole back tick thing, but, but just trust me on that. So you can do up to six of these, right? Okay. So you can do up to six of these. If you do beyond that, it doesn't really do anything and you can add those there if you want to. Uh, so that's a heading. All right. Uh, and then paragraphs, paragraphs, uh, uh, paragraphs, uh, are just, uh, consecutive lines. Uh, but generally you should, uh, make paragraphs one big long line. And this is a hotly debated one, but I'm just going to tell you why. When you make it, your paragraphs a big long line, uh, you get pluses and minuses. But one of the real big pluses is that when you split your screen in half, right? So let me put some lorem ipsum here. Bang, bang, lorem, lorem hundred. Oops. Lorem 100. There we go. So I got a hundred characters of lorem ipsum. Actually, that's way too much lorem. I don't need that much lorem. Um, uh, bang, bang, lorem. How about we just do 30? 30 characters of lorem. What the hell? That's way too much too. Oh, that's paragraphs, I think. Lorem. How about 10? It's not doing it properly. I don't remember my own command. Give me a second. Lorem. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting a whole bunch of it. Yeah, I'm not passing the extra. Oh, par par oh paragraphs. How many? Oh, it's paragraphs. I feel so dumb. I didn't do my own command. Lorem one. There, that's good. All right. So, so see how I can still go on each line, even though it's one single line, right? You know, and so that if I want to delete the line, I can delete the whole line, right? But what I wanted to show you is this. You see how I resized my terminal? All right, now let me show you the same thing. Uh, I wrote, wrote that. Yeah, you can make your own code to do that. Okay, now watch this. Okay. And watch this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to format it. So now it chops all the lines to 70 characters like we used to do in the, in the 70s and 80s. And it looks all nice and pretty, right? Until, oh my God, what the hell happened? All right. What the hell happened there? Right. And the reason for that, in, in this world of like resizable, and it doesn't even have to be Tmux, it could be anything. In the world of resizable windows, uh, the, this is a valid paragraph, is what I'm trying to tell you. Paragraphs, as I said, are just consecutive text that, are, that start on the same line, right? That's a paragraph, period. 
but I'm going to make the case, and we've standardized this at work, that you should make your paragraphs big, long ass. Sorry for the swear word. Uh, 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 lines because that line can be easier to cut and paste. It can be right. You're like, well, how do I navigate it? Well, you're going to learn how to navigate uh, pretty, pretty, pretty easily there uh, as we go. So I, I, I want, I kind of overdid that, but I like to justify my positions before I just send you down that path. Okay. Uh, for, we're not going to do Vim wrap settings right now. You're going to have to learn that up. I can't, I'm over time almost. We've only got three minutes left. All right. So we got to cover all of Markdown in that time. So paragraphs are just a big long line. We got that. Uh, as we said, started after that. Uh, what else we got? We have, we have separators we covered already. We have pictures and stuff. I'm going to go jump through this to remind myself because I, okay, formatting. Let's do inline formatting. Okay. So inline formatting. Um, so are just consecutive. I want to put, I want to make consecutive italics. So I put that around that, right? Uh, so let's do separator. There's uh, okay. Let's do formatting. Uh, use just use stars. All right. Just this is my take. Look, don't you can use underline yes and all a bunch of stuff. Just use stars, and I don't want to have to fully justify all that. Okay, bullets, stars, uh, stars. Just use stars and dashes. How about that? Uh, don't use underscores. I mean, sorry, what am I talking about? Just use stars. Um, please tell me I didn't delete that. No, I'll put my downloads. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. Just use uh, stars. Just use stars. Okay, so uh, use uh, one star for uh, italic. And it is italic, okay? It does usually render it as, um, what do I want to say here? Um, and I, or, I don't want to get into the HTML on that. The, the HTML5 italic is an invalid thing. So uh, use uh, two stars for bold and strong, okay? It's italic. It is actually uh, emphasis, but we're not going to get into that. I'm going to get some fanatic asshole is going to tell me that you should only use EM and strong, and they're absolutely wrong. And I will read you the HTML5 spec that brought I and ES back based on usage. So, but we're not going to cover that until we get to the HTML stuff at the end of the boost. So use uh, three stars. Um which is bold italic okay or strong emphasis if you are one of these html4 people uh okay so you got that now let's go look at a preview here i'm starting to get worried though because this hasn't been saved and i kind of went to the wrong page so let's show you how to save it while you're doing it okay i'm using the term save on purpose I don't want to hear it if you know what a commit means and we, they don't know that. Okay, so here you can see you got one star, two stars, and three stars, right? And they just have to remember the stars. Yes, you can use a million other things for formatting. We're not going to talk about them. Just remember the stars because I want to get to the 12 o'clock break. We're over time, so we're going to go over this boost, but I need to, we need to, we need to take a break. Uh, in fact, no, we don't. Well, I'm going to take a break on time, like I promised, and we'll come back and we'll finish the markdown. I, I don't want to do that because I end up pushing out to three years, hours, and I don't want to do that. All right, so have a, so let's just practice saving this, and we'll come back and finish markdown and the rest, right? We got time. All right, so how do I save? There's no save, Mr. Rob. Commit changes, right? So in, in, in Git terms, you don't even know what Git is yet, technically, but in Git terms, we want to make a commit, and these are... They build on top of each other, and there's a lot of things you want to know about that eventually, which we will cover. But right now, you can think of git commit as a save. And all of you who know what git is, I don't want to hear it, okay? For right now, the beginners just need to think of it as a save operation, all right? Uh, and <laughs> that's very controversial. You're going to learn how to do it right, so don't, you know, make sure you learn git after this, right? So you're going to click on commit changes. And update readme, 
fine. I don't care. We don't care about our commit messages. Yeah, I said it. You can like take me out of context and bl blast me all over the internet if you want to on this. Beginners don't need to care about commit messages for now. For now. Later on, putting a generic commit message or just writing the word save in your commit message is, 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 is like a cardinal sin that can get you drawn and quartered in some development teams. But for right now, we're just going to do save. All right. So uh, do we need a new branch? No. All right. We're just going to, we can give a description. No, nothing. You just need to click commit changes. Okay. And did you see it said saving? Yeah. So even GitHub thinks it's saving. Now, oh, hey, look, it gave us a blame now. So now we can click on a blame and it will say exactly who made the changes. So if you have multiple people that are actually working on it together, that's weird. Did it delete my lines out? It did. What? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, that's just because of the, that's interesting. Where's the code? Oh, it, it deleted the line returns out. That was very interesting. Uh, I don't remember why I did this. <laughs> don't ever admit that that's what your commit message is, that you'll get, you'll get totally, you know, shunned by the people who, who care, which includes me, but I'm not going to shun you. All right. So let's take a break. We're, we'll be back at, uh, 1210 on the dot. Actually, no, 1211. So we always start on the 11s. We're going to make that a, a, a thing. So 1211, we will start again. Uh, I'm going to put some music on. If you're on YouTube, you got to be on Twitch. If you want to hang out with us, uh, we'll talk about stories. We'll get coffee and, and stuff. But, but as far as the YouTuber is concerned, he's just going to blink and come right back. All right. So ready, start. That's right. It's 12.11. It's time to get going. Turn down the music. And let's keep going. We are still working on the markdown. So let's do that. I mean, if this is the only thing we get through, that's fine. I don't care as long as we've gone through it. Okay. Uh, we're not arguing. So first of all, we had, we had somebody point out that GitHub has assign the MD thing to something else because it uses a really brain dead markdown parser. And that's really too unfortunate, but that does mean that if you want markdown to display that you're going to need to put markdown or M down. And, uh, there are a number of languages that are covered here. Um, I use Pandoc, which, which recognizes MD as markdown. So, or make docs, which is also markdown. So, but if you want to be, uh, they all do markdown as well. So it's a little bit easier to read. So we'll use a long one. Uh, there we go. So we've got, we've got that down. And when we do that, we actually see the syntax highlighting we weren't getting before, which was making me kind of mad. So thank you for that fix. Uh, pick up consecutive lines. Here we got the formatting. Uh, I'm just going to cheat and look at my other thing again. So there we go. We got, oh yeah, monospace. Uh, I call it monospace, but you know, you call it what you want. It's, it's when you do this, right? This is mono space stuff. It's also sometimes called pre pre or pre formatted, uh, or sometimes it's called code. And actually the different pen, the different uh, markdown parsers will render it in different ways depending on uh, their flavor. But you just need to know that it is always gonna show up as that. It's, it's kind of a way of, you know, variable names, that kind of thing, right? And uh, it does have to be, in almost every parser that I know of, it has to be at the beginning, right? If you put a space there, I don't know if it'll work. But if it does work here, I know that it does not work in other ones. So make sure you did not put a space there. Okay. Um, we're not going to cover anything about uh, math jacks for now. Uh, just know that you can actually put mathematical symbols and in notation into Markdown. It's far beyond the scope of this particular tutorial. Uh, I did have one person that I mentored take all of their calculus notes and everything in Markdown using something called math jacks. So I will mention it. Uh, GitHub now, now allows math jacks, uh, which is, uh, it's a long drawn out story, 
MathJax is a form of LaTeX, and there's a huge debate about how to even say it. Uh, this is used for creating textbooks and all sorts of things. And and if you want to really, really go down the diet, the deep dive on the publishing stuff, know that. But from that, from all of those efforts, you know, they needed a, a universal language for math. And MathJax kind of came about as being the best way to do that. So if you do, you, we're not going to need it, but if you do want to take mathematical notes uh, and you want to do them in line, like you want the pi symbol without actually doing a pi symbol, um, you can do that here. Uh, what's that? Yeah. A lot. A lot of tech. People, everybody pronounces it differently. And, and it, people will like beat you to death if you get it. If you don't say it their way, some say to say latex, some people say latex, some people say whatever. There's like, seriously, there's like five different ways to say it. <laughs> By the way, that was a really great side project from a university professor who was tired of like not having to use word to write things. And so he made this entire language for mathematical notation, which became the international standard. Um, yeah. LA tech. I'm trying to find a way to, to, to demonstrate this for you. Um, uh, just really quickly. But I, the, the only reason I thought of it is because there's the inline. Oh, hey, look at this. Here's one. Um, math text. Okay, I'm just going to get you a quick one. I know I'm taking way too long, but some of you are going to care. Can you start with node? Ugh. Uh, math ML. No. No. Match X output. Lazy format. Uh, you know what? Let's do a search for math in GitHub. So GitHub recently added support for this. this is why I want to say it. Uh, writing mathematical expressions. Here we go. So uh, the sentence uses a dollar delimiter. And this is what I was trying to show you. So the other, we should probably cover this because it's the only other inline formatter. Uh, I'm curious to see if they're, GitHub has like three different renderers and um use uh dollar signs for inline math now obviously you'd have to still learn the language for math to do this right i'm I, as i said i'm just really curious to see uh but it, you know some of you are going to want to learn that so there we go look at that beautiful math notation uh latex yeah uh, to be called law tech okay well that's what i'm calling it then seems like people are chiming in on that so i mean that's pretty damn cool right so some of you're going to need math if you want to start i mean since we're doing the note thing we're probably not going to finish till december a lot of you are going to be using uh, markdown to take notes for school and if you do you can you can make immediate use of these very amazing uh notation if you want to jump ahead and learn that that math notation i just did a simple search for the new GitHub support for math, which just came last year. Again, another reason to have a beginner boost every year. This was not even supported on GitHub. It's one of those amazing things that has been around for a while. Pandoc's done it for over 10 years and it whittled its way into the mainstream and now you can do it on GitHub, okay? So, and by the way, that if you were to publish a textbook, you could use the same thing. So if you are into AI or machine learning or anything that involves math, it's definitely worth your time to learn how to represent math using this universal language for math notation. Okay. Uh, and if you want to actually do a block, we're, we're going to do blocks in a bit, but you can actually make entire blocks of it. So I'll leave that up until we get there. Uh, and yeah. So, and there's, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Where, where are we? I'm getting lost. Okay. So we got, we got that. So that's a dollar sign. Now, unfortunately, that means that when you try to use a regular dollar sign, sometimes it doesn't behave properly, right? And uh, let me give you a sense of this. So uh, careful using, I, I don't, I, uh, dollar signs uh, for money. This is something that really drives me crazy. Uh, Pandoc does not support this. And even though that's supposed to be okay, I'm, I just want to see what this does here. So this does it right. So I'm glad to see that. Pandoc does not do that, right? And we haven't done Pandoc yet, but um, Pandoc is kind of a little bit more brain dead. So if, if I put like, uh, here is $2,000, you see how it, it messed up all my syntax? 
The reason for that is because it thinks it's the beginning of a math thing. And in Pandoc, which is the thing I'm using right now, in Pandoc Markdown, you have to put its backslash in front of it. And if you have to escape uh, out your thing. Now, I don't even know if that's supported in, in, in here. We're supposed to be keeping this simple, but I think we're kind of past the simple on that part of thing. But I do want to, I'm kind of curious. I want to see if the new uh, GitHub Markdown will actually accept this is called escaping a character and uh, in Pandoc anyway, you're supposed to be able to put a backslash in front of anything at all and it will make it a real thing as opposed to what it would normally be interpreted as. Okay, so so yeah, that seems to have worked. Um, yeah, so, so to give you a sense of this, you can also do math by not using the dollar signs if you want, somebody has reminded me in the chat. Um, which uh, is another another thing, um, which if you wanted to not use the dollar signs, uh, another alternative to that is this. Um, it's a backslash paren and then another backslash paren. I mean, it, it, this is we're we're not we're not in the the realm of simple anymore, right? Uh, but that oh wow, that did not work. Look at that. I was expecting that to work. That's super interesting to me. That 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 is supposed to be a standard math jacks thing, and apparently the GitHub one doesn't use it. So we found something out today. So stay with the dollars. Stay with the dollars. Uh, yeah, and that means escaping the dollar sign. Uh, no, I I had it. Did I not have it? What did I do wrong? Did I do it wrong? Let's 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 make this a, a proper test. I could have swore I did that. I could have swore I did it, but maybe not. I'm gonna try it one more time. Does that look good? All right, let's try it. Preview. No. Damn. I, I, I am blown away by that. <laughs> Remember we said about more than one way to do it and not everybody accepts the certain way. Half the battle with Markdown is getting the way that most people accept. So, hey, how's it going? So, uh, a space after the parentheses? No, I'm using a dollar. I'm, I'm not doing that. So, okay. Um, anyway, I just use a dollar. You don't have to, bet one best way. Just use a dollar, but then that remembers you, that remember that you have to like backslash the dollar. You're going to have to do that anyway, right? Because most things are going to need that. The, the only annoyance with that is that then you try to render it and some things will put the backslash in front because they don't understand backslash escapes. It's just crazy, but you know, you, you make your decision there. This we're kind of out of the scope here anyway, because this is all not really basic stuff, but sports covering. All right. Um, what do we have next? We have, uh, so we have inline formatting. Okay. Now we need to start doing uh, block formatting and lists and stuff. Let's do that. So what about the underscore? You just shouldn't use the underscore. It's actually banned. It causes problems. Uh, don't use it. Right, don't use it. Escaping, you can use underscore for for underlining it, but don't do it because sometimes it's in the middle of the word. Escaping, as I said, you can put backslash in front of a thing. Uh, you can just put a backslash in front of it. Headings, we already covered. Uh, links and hyperlinks, words, raw URLs, and images. Okay, so this is kind of cool. Um, can you do the pan dot conversion? Uh, yes, that will that will do the pan dot conversion for it. Yeah, actually. Oh, uh, you know what? That's funny you say that. Let me let me show you. You know, Pandoc. This is so cool. Can I? Show, oh, I've, I'm so glad you mentioned that. You can actually do the Pandoc Git Vim plugin supports uh, inline rendering in Vim on the terminal. Yeah, watch watch this. Oh damn, I didn't do it. What did I do wrong? Oh, is it indented? Is it because it's indented? Here is an inline. Oh, I didn't do it. Sometimes it will do it. Oh, it did the two. It did the two, but it didn't do the other ones. So, so it will. You can actually get it to render certain things like inline while in your in your Vim editor using the conceal mode. All right, well, we're going to talk about all that when we get to Vim. All right, let's go back to our thing. Um, we are talking about. We did math already. No, you're going away now. We're talking about, okay, links. 
so links let's do links um when you want to click on a thing it's called a hyperlink hyperlinks are one of the worst things ever invented for the world Wide web i hate them because they're always wrong they're always pointing to stuff that's out of date or broken but how do you do them right uh so if we wanted to let's say you know you know what i'm not even gonna do it here i'm just gonna show you because it's gonna be faster and we got a lot of cover okay when you want to do a link do this all right here is a link you put you put a bracket around it square brackets around the text okay and then you put the thing that you want it to go to now I don't want to hear about all the extra stuff that you can put in the link. That's all that you need to know right now. If you really want to dig into all the other things you can do in the links, you can do that. I don't want to waste people's time right now. All right now by doing that, this is called an inline link, right? And that's really the only thing you need to know right now. And there, there is another way to do a link that allows you to, to decouple the links and put them down someplace else and group them all together, especially if they're really, really long. Uh, but for now, just just use this, okay? And there's a really there's a number of reasons to use the inline ones, even if they're annoying and obviously long, because it doesn't separate the code. So when you cut and paste the code that has the link in it, the link goes with it. If you use the other what are called reference links, if you use reference links instead, they're at the bottom of the page or something. Then if you go to copy and paste that paragraph someplace else, you have to also remember to go copy and paste the link at the bottom of the page. And inevitably, you'll forget to do that. You'll wonder if this link is even used. You'll go down to your bottom of your reference links at the bottom of the page. You're like, why is this here? I don't have, I'm not using it anywhere in the file. I can't find it because you already moved it someplace else. Just trust me. Use the inline linking for now. It'll be easier for you. Okay. Uh, and, and when you hear about reference links, you'll know that what they are. Okay. So uh bu, 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 bu. so that's link so go ahead and try that when you when you have an uh, uh, an inline link uh you'll be able to click on it and and i've got that illustrated here so so you see this here and it, how it gets rendered it, it re depends entirely on uh you know how your websites are going to so it's going to be different in, 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 in github i'm not going to do that right now but you can try it uh for right now use full urls just know that if you want to link to something that's in the same directory, so let's say you have another page that's in the same place, and please don't try to link between different directories and stuff yet. It's very complicated on GitHub. It doesn't do what you think. Just for right now, keep everything in the same place, okay? And, and then if you want to make another file besides readme.md, you can make another file, and then you can link to that file by just putting the name of the file between parentheses, okay? So the name of the file would go here. So this is an external link. Uh, and then, you know, the other one is, is the, um, is, is, is that other kind of link? Okay. And let's, let's move on from that. Uh, if you want to, and, and I actually strongly suggest you start doing this. I think it's personally in my Zettelcast notes, I never have links that are not also visible on the page. And so what I will do is I'll, let me show you. So I will like, this is something I've learned from sad experience because if you, sometimes you want to write a bibliography or something, right? And you want that link to be visible. So a lot of times I'll say, you know, here is a, uh, or in the uh, skillstack.io website, you know, and then down here I'll put uh, an actual link like this, skillstack.io, and, and I will put them out on their own bulleted lines so that they are printed in the screen. And, and let me tell you why this is, this has burned me so many times. Um, this this creates documents that contain the URLs. And I know you don't think about printing, but I've dealt with a lot of teachers before, and the teachers are always printing out stuff and handing it out to their kids because it's easier than distributing the files. And believe it or not, people still use printing. I know it's, you know, old-fashioned and everything, but they still do it. And what happens when you have a link, right? So if I go to print this page, the link gets printed with it. This is also why when you're writing bibliographic content, uh, notes and stuff, you, they make you type out the link, right? So when you're doing markdown, I'm going to suggest that you, use, you don't over encumber your paragraphs with these big ass, sorry for the swear word, uh, URLs, and you refer to them rhetorically, like on the, you know, Bureau of Labor Management's uh, website, there is information about why cybersecurity is the fastest growing technical profession, 
right? And then in a paragraph right after that, or in a related, a related link section or something like that, you actually put the entire URL surrounded by what are called angle brackets, less than or greater than signs. And then you click on that thing and then now it appears in the page. So it's a permanent part of, of anything that would be visible, whether it gets rendered as a PDF or something like that. These are small considerations that I promise you will pay off big dividends later if, if you just start to practice them. You can also use linking uh, to link to mail to URLs. Um, and you can, you know, you, you can even use phone numbers, which is kind of cool. Actually, if you've tried the telephone, uh, format, you can be on your phone and you can come into one of these links and click on it and it'll like pull it up in your, in your phone contacts. That's kind of fun. Uh, if you want to put that stuff out there and not everybody does, but, um, and let's keep going. We got, we got a lot to cover. I don't know how much, God, we're almost over. Um, I mean, if, if all you can do is take notes, I think we're good. So if you want to put an image on a page, you don't know about this yet, so you don't need to do this. But if, first of all, how would you even get an image there? So let, let me actually download this image, all right? So save image as, uh, Mr. Rob Gnome, save. Okay, so let's do, uh, this is actually kind of cool. I want to show you this. GitHub, GitHub does this. Um, so first of all, I need to commit the changes I've made so far. I, I know I'm not going to put a good notes in there. Now watch, watch this, watch. Whoop. Oops, that didn't work. I know, I know, where is it? Code, here we go. Edit. There, watch, watch, watch. This is, this is, I, I hope this still works. This used to work really cool. Uh, images. Watch, watch you drag it and drag it in here like this. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Isn't that cool? I think that is so cool that uploaded the image and committed it. And now I can preview it. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so let's say, so let's say during your note taking, you take a screenshot, right? Which you might want to do. You take a screenshot or you have a picture, or you have a diagram that I put up there. You can just go there and you can literally drag it in and it will give a link to it. And you don't even, I mean, but it also kind of gives you the, it, it, it does all the hard part for you, which is it shows you. So this, this here is what's called the alt text. That's the stuff. So if you hover over it, it shows you that, right? And then it, it creates, it uploads the file, creates a URL to the file and then links it. And the secret difference is this exclamation point right here. That's the main point. So you have this, what is this sorcery? So you have this exclamation point here and that'll, um, that'll show you this, this, this little thing here. Okay. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, you get your preview, they you got your picture, right? So, so that's images. Uh, and again, I mean, this is one of the reasons I wanted to show you the graphic user interface for, so maybe, maybe you're, you know, you're doing a bunch of graphical things and you don't necessarily want to use the terminal. It's actually worth it to know how to edit files using GitHub all by itself, uh, particularly for note taking, right? So because of these reasons I just showed you, so you can do this anywhere, uh, live on GitHub. I just put them in a private repo anywhere on GitHub. Uh, Hey, Austrian. All right, so there's our names and um, and and stuff, right? Now you can take this one step further, and you can make this see the difference between these two images. This one has see my my cursor is an arrow, and the cursor over here is a is a hand, right? So I can click on this, and it will actually go to Art of Rob Live, which is a, a really really old website that I need to take down, uh, but it works. Okay, so you can basically this is just you can combine links with pictures and make the pictures linkable if you want to okay uh so if i wanted to do that in this case i would be you know putting some stuff around that and i'm not gonna bother because we're we're gonna lose time it's right there though that's all you have to do you just see how the, this internal stuff right here uh is the image right and the rest of it is uh, the link. So you can combine those things. It's a little bit complicated, but yeah. And you can paste it into the editor too. You can control V. Yeah. You can also control V. You can copy and paste screenshots directly into the editor in, in VS Code. Thank you for the reminder on that LBG as well. Super cool stuff. Okay. Uh, so 
uh, this here is a call out. We'll get to that. Lists. All right. Now, lists are one of the things you're going to be using the most. You've seen me already start to use them in my notes here. So, lists are, are just, I, I have had some debate with people about whether to just use stars for lists, right? Uh, I've had a, a, a number of good friends of mine make strong cases to use dashes for lists instead of stars. And the way that they their thinking goes is that the dashes or the so so you can make a list with a, a bullet, a star, a dash or a plus, right? And people have made the case to me that if you use a plus, it creates a, an expanded rotator list in some versions of Markdown. So on this particular point about what you use for your bulleted lists, that is up to you. But if I decided to make all of these dashes, it does not care. Pandoc is going to render them all as, as bullets. So the, the, the takeaway from this is a list is just uh, something that begins with a space right after, always a space after it. There are some versions of Markdown that will really croak on it if it doesn't have a space. And it has to be the first thing in the line or within the first two characters, but just make it at the beginning of the line, okay? And then if you want to do a sublist, uh, it needs to be at least, I think, four spaces over uh, to be the most consistent, okay? I do reach out a little bit, yes. So so there you go. Try to use the same. Uh, so you see how these, these are getting rendered, right? And you'll notice that those are all rendered the same way, all right? So here's an example of that. This, this, this formatting indentation is not my fault. I swear to God, it's my browser. If I show it in Firefox, it works. Uh, it's, it, it has something to do with the way Chrome and Firefox view... Uh, 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 non non breaking white space. It's really annoying. But anyway, um, so this that's what that is. And then you get bullets or whatever your list items are, right? To do a list that has numbers in it, which is actually called an ordered list, because there's no guarantee that it's going to be a number. That's really important. All right. The, if you make an ordered list, there's no guarantee it's going to be a number. You're like, why are they all ones, Mr. Rob? I mean, I'm going to make a strong case for this. If you're, unless you're really sure that somebody's going to read the source code and uh, you have some way to renumber your list items really easily built into your editor. I mean, most editors will do it automatically. I am going to make a case to use ones. And because when you use one dot, that's the token that it looks for. When you do that, you can reorder your list items any way you want, anytime, and they will renumber automatically when they're rendered. So you don't have the extra step of converting them. Now, most editors will do the conversion for you automatically uh, while you're changing it. But then the person who has to use Vim that doesn't do that, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. In fact, in my case, uh, what I will sometimes do is this. I'll do, if, if, it's, if I know, you know, some, I'll say one, uh, two, uh, three, right? So, you know, if you were to look at this, watch and this, but you want to see what the HTML looks like. Here's what the HTML looks like. One, two, three, right? So it makes a list item, an ordered list. Now, if I wanted to render them, I have a, a little tool that does one, two, three. It just converts them over, right? And both of these are valid markdown, but there's a pretty strong case to just use ones uh, unless you need to know the exact number while you're writing the source and make sure you don't go over it. Um, so that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. Separators we covered already. Hard returns. If you add two blank spaces, there are a number of ways of doing hard returns, but two blank spaces is the most universal. So if you want a line to end in the middle, right? Let me go back and show you. Um, not that one. Where is it? Okay, so if, if you want a line to end in the middle, where is my thing here? All right, so... Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, uh, hard, hard breaks. Okay. So roses are red space, space violets are blue. Now this is kind of nice to have an editor that will show you those extra spaces. Uh, there is a, there are, uh, is a group of people that really hate this because you can't see it and those are the kind of people that like putting blank spaces at the end of everything i actually like that it's readable 
uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that is a hard break. Uh, if you have an editor that knows hard breaks, uh, like mine, uh, it'll show you. All right. And there are alternatives to hard breaks, but sometimes you really do want a hard break. Usually when it's like this, you want the other formatting to be the same. Um, but we're going to come up with some other methods of putting stuff like that into a block by itself if you want. Um, there, Some editors will do a, a backslash in front of a space, but not all of them support it. So then you end up with a backslash in the middle of your of your of some people's you know renders and that's worse than having you know the extra space not be observed or something uh but it is it's pretty infuriating a lot of people do not like that at all uh i try to avoid it as much as possible but it it is occasionally required so i put it in there um and what else we got uh so as you can see you can see a little arrow sign there all right now we're going to talk about blocks for a bit and i think um if you remove the spaces, it no longer hard breaks, right? So, so he, let me give you another alternative to that right away, and and this is called um, this is called a uh, you know if you like so if you wanted to get the same sort of accomplished same sort of thing accomplished, you can the formatting is different, right? But you can use uh you can use just a, a block a regular indented block right now um we're gonna just do uh, uh verbatim i call them uh, verbatim blocks so a verbatim block is any any block that begins with four spaces or more this is people don't like this i'm telling you one two three four roses are red uh violets are blue all right, so, yep, and and there you go. So, but you can you already be able to tell the difference here. Um, uh, as you can see, it's now it considers it like code, right? So if it had any other formatting on it, it would be lost. And so I'm gonna let you make the decision there, uh, depending on what kind of thing you're writing. I I think that prose and like if you're gonna cite you know, there's quotations and stuff too, but if, you know, I, it's a tough call. It's a tough call, but I'll let you make that decision. Um, I tend to not use verbatim blocks at all. My preferred way for using verbatim blocks is three back ticks because I like the consistency. Three back ticks with no type is exactly the same uh, as the other, right? exactly the same so whether you indent by four spaces in which case you have to make sure everything's indented the same way uh i i tend to not like that for my blocks period i want really clear delimiting on my blocks i want my blocks to be always three back ticks the reason for that is let's say you're parsing through and I've, I've written shell scripts like this in like you know a couple minutes because i follow this because i follow very consistently a an, an three back tick block notation you can use 10 20 back ticks you can use tildes and all this stuff right i just always use three back ticks and the reason is because i can always parse that out with a simple shell script in five minutes if i allow artistic expression of how to indicate a block is there i have to account for an infinite number of ways to have a block and i lose the ability to parse out these blocks uh, and ignore them in different ways that I might want. I might want to look for a keyword that only exists in a block or a keyword that does not exist in any blocks, right? You lose all of that if you make complicated block delimiters because as soon as you do that, you have to have a full blown markdown parser that to even get into it. And now you're using an entire API in a library. But if I use a consistent block fence this is what this is called then i can do all of this code in a couple lines of bash you know in five minutes so i i just want to stress this to everybody please use consistent practices whatever it is in all of your code base and knowledge base because you will be able to script access to that finding searching and everything else much more easily if you force yourself 
to have these constraints. You don't have to use my constraints if you don't want to. I'm just telling you why I use mine. But that I just want to reiterate that before we go. It's really important because you're going to have thousands and thousands of lines of notes and, and pages of notes over time. And if you don't believe me, go look at my set. And you're going to be parsing this stuff all the time. And if, if, if it's not consistent, you're going to get really annoyed at, because you're not going to be able to get to what you want. Okay, so um, I mean, that's the whole point of making it into code. So code fences, we just talked about that. If you add a, 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 a little thing to the front of the code fence, uh, you get that. Yes, this is so broken. I got to fix this. Um, you get a, you get that language, right? So, uh, you can go ahead and try that right now. I, I'm, we're, we're kind of going out, running out of time, so I need to go. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to 130, I think. Okay. So, um, code fences are so awesome and there are something there are hundreds and hundreds of different little tags you can use uh to have them render so that you can read them uh that's what this has done i mean you already saw me do this once with the markdown you saw i put the syntax highlighting in it automatically um and stuff like that so here are some of the common ones i put md uh there but we now know that md is not supported by github so you probably want to put markdown so that's the old information so do at markdown full markdown if you want markdown to render on github uh, JSON, JavaScript, HTML, blah, 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 right? So, and, and by the way, if you always are using the three dashes, then you also have the advantage of saying later on when you write codes, let's say you have like a 2000 node knowledge base, you could go back and say, show me all of my examples that have JavaScript. And now be, all you have to do is grep out all the lines that have three back ticks and JS after it, as long as you've been consistent. Right, and if you have been, and you and anybody else contributing has followed your your style guidelines, you can now mine that information in a few lines of shell code, and that's very very powerful. So um, exception for Markdown, um, and uh, yeah. So let me just talk about this for a second. Unfortunately, there has to be an exception to this rule that I have to talk about. Um, so the um, if you're just beginning to use Markdown, you don't need to worry about this, but I'm going to mention it. There is one, there's, there's it's kind of a two-parted exception, right? When you're including Markdown, uh, when you're including Markdown inside of Markdown, it's kind of an inception sort of situation like this, right? There is a problem because how do you write markdown without it being seen as markdown right and i don't even want to talk about it but if you want to have markdown be a part of your documentation so like say for example today you're taking notes on markdown and you want to take notes about markdown in markdown right uh that those are the the cases where i would allow myself to use tildes so uh, to be fair, code fences can be either tildes or backticks, and frankly, they can be as many as you want, but I'm suggesting you use three. And the only time you'll ever see me use tildes is if I use three tildes in Markdown uh, or four tildes in Markdown. So four tildes in Markdown is Markdown that has Markdown in it as well, which is even more complicated. Uh, but this will occasionally crop up when you're taking notes about markdown that's the only time i follow that method and 99 percent of my notes don't have anything related to that in it i don't even search for it when i'm grepping for for code blocks because i don't normally take notes on markdown right i use markdown for itself uh but that's worth mentioning so you know about that um so yeah let's go back to um yeah, Markdown exception. Uh, infinite possibilities. Um, so, okay, block quotes. I these days I don't use block quotes very much anymore. Um, and let me tell you why. So, a block quote is when you put what's called a right opening bracket, otherwise known as a a greater than sign. Okay, so uh, block quotes. Uh, here is a quote about something, right? And that's a one liner. Right now, if it's one paragraph, it's going to be all in one line. Now this, this stuff is really legacy because in the old days of email, 
the reason Gruber and the gang and Aaron did this is because back when we used to write email using Eudora, if you're that old, uh, when you responded to somebody, it would put their original post. It would put it would put uh, you know these these uh, greater than signs in front of it, right? And it would do it automatically. So uh, something uh, blank, you know, blank line, uh, another line, right? And so this 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 automatic you know insertion of these these things everything was also by the way not big long paragraphs because you know, back then we were always part so so blog quotes are are largely affected by the legacy requirements that were around for Markdown and I tend to not like them that much uh, because they're so hard to maintain if you're if you're doing them all the time it's really hard to maintain but if you want a blog quote you can do that now. They're also really hard to parse if you're writing parsers, which I have. And the reason they're hard is because the way this goes is I can have uh, I can have one inside of another one inside of another one. And that's also an artifact from history because people would have, you know, like five, six, seven, eight levels of indentation. And, you know, before they they lost it all, uh, you tend I, that, I just want you to know that that does work but that you probably don't want to do that in your notes, right? Uh, sometimes block quotes are nice for calling things out. Uh, you know, I, I, so let me just put it this way. When, when I use a block quote these days, I make sure it's an actual quote, that it doesn't have multiple levels, that it's, and then I make sure that it's almost all on one line. And if I have a blank line, I'll put it here, uh, another line, right? And I'll do something like that. But you need to have them. They need to attach. You can't have... If you have two separate ones, they make it into two separate block quotes. Uh, everybody emails like that too still. Uh, okay, so so here we go. Um, again, you can you can read... This is just my suggestions, but you can, you can make your own decisions on this. Uh, again, I'm just going to strongly advocate for consistency, but you do need to do that. Block quotes are not as bad... Uh, if you use the single long line paragraph method, you just have to make sure to connect those paragraphs, right? Uh, and they will um, auto wrap properly while you're resizing your terminal windows and panes and everything. Comments. Uh, so strictly speaking, Markdown does allow some HTML to be written in it. Uh, Markdown was invented. It was invented directly and specifically to make it into HTML. So Gruber and Schwartz, decided to say that you can put a bunch of HTML in there and it will just go in as is. Uh, the number one thing I want to tell you here is don't put HTML in your markdown. I'm going to say that again. Don't put HTML in your markdown. Is it true that you can do italics and all this markdown stuff instead or you want to use these extra tag, you know, CSS tags and intermix your HTML and your markdown? Don't do it absolutely do not do it because as soon as you put markdown as soon as you put html in your markdown you have just complicated the requirement to parse that knowledge uh like over nine thousand. i mean now 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 you have to have a full-blown html parser built into what would otherwise be a very simple parser just to parse markdown uh, when my, my friends and I from the original mentor group, the uh, Skillstack Pros, reconsidered how the internet could work, we made the knowledge exchange grid, and its base format was basic markdown for that reason. Because because it you can you can actually imply a bunch of semantic value from just markdown. It's a paragraph, it's a list, it's a whatever, right? We don't have to have all the extra markdown and we don't have to have all the extra overhead and all of the the just crazy crazy artifacts and and legacy stuff that that exists in html so i'm going to say it again don't put html in your markdown unless it's in a, a fence and it's uh, you're you're writing notes about html don't use html as markdown and if you do you won't be able to parse it at all in pandoc right and if you do get away with it in github github will deliberately blocks a bunch of other tags you can't even remember which tags they block so just i'm just telling you don't put html in your markdown however there is one exception that i sometimes find to be okay 
and that is the comment. This is actually not HTML at all. This is SGML, which is the predecessor to HTML. Uh, and this comment is, this is a way if you wanted to put something in your markdown that won't render, you can do that, right? Now, I, I think it's a bad idea to do that because most of the time when you're doing markdown, people are gonna be able to go to the source anyway. And why would you put comments in there? Just, just, just put it to do in there that's readable or something. But, but if there's any reason in your notes that you wanna put it to do, like come back and document this thing here, you could maybe do that. But that's usually better done as something that's not in the source code. Right. So as uh, an issue or a ticket on your repo uh, or as a, you know, there's just a million other ways to do it without putting a comment. So you might just want to skip over the whole comment thing. Um, uh, okay. So, so that's it. That's it for Markdown. Uh, how many minutes we got? We got another half an hour left, I think. Right. How much, how much time are we going? Where did I put my, uh, where did I put my calendar? I need to go find my calendar. I can't remember how, how, how long we decided to go. I actually just changed. Okay, yeah, we have another half an hour. Okay, so um, you should be able to take notes now, all right? Um, and we're going to now talk about containers for the next half an hour. We're going to do Dr. Desktop, and actually, we're going to get the terminal installed as well. I'm going to show you how, what to do there. Uh, I'm not going to install the terminal, but I'm going to show you what to install. Uh, we're going to review what to install with Docker Desk, uh, with Podman Desktop. I said Docker Desktop. I'm sorry if I said the wrong thing earlier. Uh, I meant Podman Desktop. And and now you you've got enough of your notes and you've got your notes started, right? Make sure you save your notes, everybody. Uh, and just a number of, before we leave the GitHub thing, uh, just as kind of a fun thing here and a preview of to why to use Git, uh, you can actually click on notes here, and you can see that there have been four commits, right? So let's say you accidentally deleted something that you might still want, or you, a, a, another worst case scenario, you've actually deleted something you don't ever want anybody to ever see again. <laughs> so let's say you accidentally save a password in your notes, even though it's in your private GitHub repo, it's still a bad idea, right? And you might think, oh God, I gotta delete that. So you delete it out, and then you go to hit save again, right? So I'm gonna warn you about this now before we get into Git. So if you click on four commits, Every single commit that has ever been made is is here available to look at, right? You can see every single one, all right? And, and I want you to understand the implications of this, okay? Uh, because if you accidentally say something bad or mean about somebody, which I have done in the past, <laughs> and, or a technology or something, Mr. Rob sucks, oh my God, I can't understand anything he's saying, you know, and, and, and they, people can go through your Git commit history and they can see everything you ever saved. They can see everything you ever changed about it, okay? So I want to put that full disclosure out there for you. I don't want to start you thinking it's just another save function because it really isn't. It's adding incremental saves to everything. And this is another reason to make it private. So maybe you put something accidentally in there because you're a brand new beginner here, uh, you know, and, and you don't want it there. And, and that would be the way to do it. There is a way to remove a commit, but it's very complicated. Uh, it's almost easier to just delete the repo and make a copy of it. Uh, but you know, you lose your history and stuff, so don't do that. Um, but my, the point is, is that this is all being saved. So for better or worse, you can go back and see every single change you made. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> Rob sucks. <laughs> People uh, so, so just know that that's there. Um, uh, I won't say how or who or where, but I happen to know of one scenario where the private secure keys for a person were saved in their GitHub. In fact, do you want me to show you how to hack everybody? You know you do. I know you want me to show you this. I, I almost don't want to do it. This is this. I'm going to show you anyway. Look, I'm not showing you how to hack. Damn, what is that? That's a that's not so, that's not something that's something different. GitHub.com. All right, so watch this. I'm going to show you something. All right, so begin private key. <laughs> Search all of GitHub. Hey, look. <laughs> oh, damn. I'm going to get in trouble. 
this is for educational purposes. This is for educational purposes. The repository is empty. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, anyway, there are certain keywords. <laughs> there are certain keywords that you can look for in GitHub. Uh, oh, there's somebody else's private key. <laughs> there's somebody else's private key. There's somebody else's private key, private key, private key, private key. Any one of these people could probably be compromised with stuff that they saved in their public GitHub repo. Remember that part where I told you to make it a private repo? So while you're a beginner, at least make all your first repos private. So if you make a mistake and you accidentally save something that you don't want, at least it's not exposed to everybody. GitHub will have access to it, but not the whole world like these poor souls. So uh, if I'm going to teach you about GitHub, that's the one thing I'm going to teach you. Be careful how you save things and always default to private so that you can learn until you learn how to use Git and GitHub. That'll save you from a bunch of like career ending mistakes and they are career ending. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, yep. Yeah. It's something like secrets, Kubernetes secrets. There's a million things you can go out there and find if you are so inclined. The only reason I'm showing you that is because I don't want you to be the person that we pull up on the screen. Okay? Don't be that fool. Don't be that fool. Now you know, right? You didn't know before. Now you do, right? So don't be the fool who accidentally saves something to a public repo by, number one, defaulting to a private repo for all your notes, right? And, and then, two, you know, learning how to use Git before you really get in trouble. And we are going to cover Git later, just not right now. All right, so we have, um, unless it's intentional, <laughs> maybe maybe they're trying to get you. You never know. Sometimes they, yeah, that, that's true too. Somebody might be putting a honeypot out there to catch you. So by the way, if you think that you're all cool, you're a cool hacker now, and you're going to go do what I just did, and you're going to go hack one of those people that put their private key out there, and you're going to go read about how to do that, you might be falling right into a honey trap or into a, um, a honeypot trap. So you might... It might be some stupid person, but it might be some really, really smart person who's going to catch a stupid person who's going to want to try to be a hacker and hack them. So don't just go hacking willy nilly. Right. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So and I, I love making me a good honeypot. I'm going to put that out there. So it's so much fun to catch people who don't know what they're doing. Uh, when I, you know, I've caught people before. OK, so what's next? Uh, we did Markdown. Uh, what was on the agenda? Let's go back to our thing. I think we need to do, we did the repo, uh, learning markdown basics. We did that. Uh, okay. We talked about using the web interface. We did that. Okay. So we've actually covered everything in the main start, start taking notes phase. I did spend a lot of time on that. Uh, the next two things are, uh, I, we're probably not going to get to installing a bunch of Linux. We might. We have 30 minutes, 25 minutes left. Okay. Okay. So the next thing is how to get the terminal. Um, you do, how do you get it and remove it from the commit? I we're not going to cover that. It's out of scope. Uh, but when we get to get, we'll talk about that. Um, okay. So if um, you can ask that question in Discord, two people can help you. If, you if, if anybody has actually saved a secret in, in there and needs help, go into the Discord and ask some questions. We'll help you out. Okay. So. Um, we're going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes. So this is put a chapter marker here. Um, talking about terminals, hopefully only five or 10 minutes, right? So get a terminal. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. And let me show you the two terminals uh, that I recommend. Okay. So the first one is uh, windows terminal preview, right? And we're just going to search in Google for this or whatever windows. Uh, terminal preview. Make sure you get preview, by the way. Uh, I don't know if it's if been updated or not, but it was only the preview version that had the um, uh, rendering acceleration added to it at one point. I, I think that's that was probably a year ago. It's probably in the main version now. I don't know. But it's always good to get the Windows Terminal Preview. Uh, this is the part where I get attacked in the comments about recommending this terminal and a windows tool above others. And I'm going to tell you why I think you should use windows terminal preview. Uh, first of all, you're not going to be splitting your screens up at all using windows. We're going to use Tmux for that. So, um, 
The terminal for the Mac is iTerm2. Don't worry, we're going to talk about that too. All right. If you're a Mac user right now and you want to do this while we're talking about it, let me tell you the two. So, Mac iTerm2, it's a free app. You can go get iTerm2, Mac OS terminal replacement. Uh, iTerm2 has Tmux integration and a bunch of other really great things that are going to that are going to help you. So get that installed. Okay. Get iTerm2 installed. I you the the normal terminal for for Mac is fine and good and it works for a lot of people, but I promise you, you're gonna you're gonna eventually want to use iTerm2. Uh, I eventually gave up and started doing that. Terminal for Ubuntu and Pop OS. Uh, if you already have that, just use the terminal that GNOME, just use uh, GNOME terminal that comes with it. We are not going to install Alacrity. Somebody out there in the comments is gonna say Alacrity is awesome. It is awesome. It's also flawed, like really flawed. Uh, it it's sort of fast. It does not follow the ASCII standard. So a bunch of the different uh, like Blink, for example, a bunch a bunch of little ASCII terminal escapes and stuff like that are not supported at all. Uh, I used Alacrity for a year. Uh, inevitably, somebody's going to tell you to use it. I strongly recommend against using Alacrity for now, um, for lots of reasons. But it, not to mention, not the least of which is Windows Terminal Preview is the standard terminal application for you know windows and and iterm2 has is kind of the default standard terminal application for mac there is a mac terminal application uh that you can use too if you want to okay so uh that's all i'm going to say about the terminals you need to get those things installed and you need to start using them okay and uh suckless term i've heard is a good one too a uh, console for kd i mean there's there's everybody has got a suggestion about their favorite terminal okay i am telling you what the two leading terminals are in the world <laughs> okay and those are the ones that you're most likely to find and that are going to be used they're going to be approved for enterprise work and usage that are going to be in the the store if you have one separate from the external sources those are the things right so uh i term two and or the internal terminal for mac and these and then just install these okay and the first thing you're going to say is mr Rob, i want to make my terminal look pretty there is one other way to get a terminal and i it's probably worth mentioning but i don't suggest you do this you could get um ms version uh, Vir Vir visual studio code has a terminal interface built into it uh so that is a possibility uh i don't want to even put it there though because I think someone's going to do it and then they're going to want to know all about VS code and they're going to be mad because their terminals aren't working and stuff. Um, so, you know, but I'm going to put it as a, as an option if you want to do that. I, I, sometimes the fastest way to get a terminal is to just use VS code. Uh, and you know, visual studio code, if you're on uh, windows or Mac, actually, um, bash just does work in a windows terminal. Yes, it does. We're going to, we're going to, show you something about how to do that next so uh vs studio code so this is it's it's worth mentioning visual studio code okay uh i'm trying to be nice about this uh what about uh visual studio code by the way make sure it's code and not visual studio they're totally different if you choose to go this route all right uh Visual Studio Code is hands down the leading industry tool for editing and compiling. I mean, not for editing, but for editing source code these days. Uh, and you'll probably worth it'd be probably worth getting. Um, however, however, uh, let me show you what it looks like. And in fact, I can actually. I don't. Do I still have it installed? I don't think I do. I guess I don't have it on right now. Um. We're, we're about learning about the terminal. So, so that's what it, it does have a terminal in it. If you want to do that, we're not talking about integrating projects. We're talking about one read me. We're not doing full Git. We're just doing note taking. So you can download that and install that and, and use that. What I wanted to show you is that, and here it is right here is that visual studio code has a terminal in it. And how much time we got? We have enough time to do that. So I, you know what, next week we'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a really quick tour of visual studio code uh it is i i need to do this because i used to install visual studio code for all of my people that when we mentored um because it is it is the most appealing option for 
people who don't want to really jump into the terminal right away, but this boost is about the terminal. But if you want to get into, I mean, you'll, you've got to learn VS Studio Code no matter what, because there's a good chance people are going to be using it. Uh, it does have that. It's easier to use for Git integration. It has really pretty colors really easily. That's the reason I actually started using it is because when you're dealing with nine to 18 year olds, they really respond well to all the different theming they can do, even though, and to the fact that VS Studio Code, Visual Studio Code is consistent across all operating systems. It's the same tool on Linux, Mac, and uh, Windows. Right. So uh, it's also relatively fast. I, I used it for a good two years before it got so bloated. Uh, it, it got it got really bad to use. Again, this boost is about the terminal for Linux skills. It's not about how to write code. If well, we're going to cover VS Studio Code, we would be covering it a lot more during uh, a coding boost. And we might return to VS Studio Code when we do that. Um, we, we're planning a day where we're going to uh, actually two Saturdays where we're going to go through the different uh, Python. We're going to go through Python and um, Perl, and and we're going to also go through Go and C, and just to give you an ex an experience of of coding, but not to actually dive into the languages at all. And when we do that, we'll talk about the editors for those things, and that will inclu include coming back to here. But the only time, the only reason I want to mention Visual Studio Code right now is it does have an integrated terminal, and by default, it will use the default Windows terminal which is CMD, which is really horrible. So uh, I want to put another thing on here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and put this um, on here. So install, uh, install git bash. And I am going to get so much hate mail for saying this. And you know, what up? what's up with, Visual, with WSL2 and blah, 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 blah. And I don't want to get into it right now. I don't want to. If you want to fight with me about what the fastest way to get bash on Windows is, you can do it in the Discord and we can fight all day. My suggestion for the boost so we can just keep moving is to install git bash, okay? And the if you're on Windows. So this is required for the boost. If you're going to do the boost, I want you to do this. Even if you don't want to do anything else and you want to use WSL2 or whatever, or you've already installed WSL2, why am I doing this? I'm using a VM. Install git bash. Okay, I promise you you're gonna want it uh, So git bash You can just search for git bash. Okay, why git bash git bash is git for Windows right uh, And and yes, it's ugly as sin by itself But we're not gonna use it by itself Okay, this is ugly, right? This is the same, as you can tell, this is the same as my Git. This is a terminal that's running Bash on Windows. Why would I ever run Windows Bash on Windows, Mr. Rob? Uh, let me give you a little quick story about this. Yesterday, my Zwift, I've been doing this Zwift streaming, right? And I found a bug in the 1.39 release of Zwift, which uh, was killing the Downtown Titans map, which I had done three times in a row, and it got stuck on zero meters, even after 30 minutes of writing after that. Didn't give me credit. And because I had Git Bash, I was able to use all of the terminal magic that I'm gonna we're gonna go through on the boost. I was able to use all of this terminal amazing magic on Windows. And I'm not talking about WSL2, which is a separate thing from Windows. WSL2 is not Windows. WSL2 is actually Linux running in a separate virtual machine that sort of feels like it's in windows but it's not it's separate it's like having a different computer inside your computer we'll talk about that when we talk about virtual machines git bash is windows right so it's a shell and this is a shell which we're talking about what a shell is a shell is a command line interface more or less uh usually a command line interface into a larger thing that's why it's called a shell it's the outer shell right and and usually shells are command line e they're not always but um that's what they are and so git bash does not reinvent anything git bash is the bash shell the standard for this boost and for the entire linux world it is the default standard shell on all linux operating systems except for a few tiny ones like alpine and and uh, these days, uh, Kali, which both use Z shell, which is an inferior shell, which I will justify that statement uh, another day. So you want to install Git Bash. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, install Git Bash, and you will be happy. 
I, so the end of my story is this. I could not find the files that I was looking for, right? So I was CDing around and I was using all my Linux and Unix skills to go around and use very powerful commands, including find, to do things that I normally would only do on a Unix machine on my Windows file system, okay, without having to mount it into a VM and all that. So the long story short is install git bash if you're going to install vs code by the way install git bash first because if you install git bash first i know that's kind of out of order but if you install git bash first and then you install vs code vs code will see git bash i'm like oh my god we're using bash for your shell we're not going to use powershell by default right and i don't have anything against powershell other than i hate it but this is this is about linux it's about bash and all of that stuff and this is how you get bash on Windows. This is a uh, this, this project has been around forever. This project is an umbrella of the Git project itself, which also is the reason GitHub exists. This is the standard way to use Git on Windows. Period. This is the official way to use Git on Windows. End of debate. Okay. So if you don't want to do that, that's fine. If you have, want to use some other way, that's up to you. But the standard way to use Git on Windows is get SCM at gitforwindows.org. That, that is straight out of the mouth of the Git project itself. So it behooves you to learn it, even if you want to do one of these other things. Okay. And so, so install it and, you know, you can complain in the Discord and we can fight about it there. Okay. Um, and, and then you, you obviously you don't want this this UI this is so it's kind of ugly right and that's why you installed Windows Terminal so when you pull up uh, Windows Terminal uh, preview where did mine go here we go uh, you get you get uh, this uh, I'm actually full screen right now so I'll unfull screen it and uh, it's kind of big so so there we go and then you can add new windows so you see I can add git bash I can have the PowerShell I can have all these different virtual machines, which we're not going to talk about right now. Uh, yeah. I have gotten old. <laughs> so, so go ahead and do get bash. There you go. And then you get, you get, this is, this is, you know, this is my windows machine and it's got my prompt. You're like, how do I get the colors and everything? Uh, the colors are, for right now, just use the colors you have, right? So next week, we'll talk about colors and cleaning it up and making it pretty and all that. Uh, it's actually pretty involved, um, but you basically, you go get a Java, you're going to get a, a JSON file and you're going to dump it in here. Uh, if you want to, the preview of that, you go to your settings file, you look up all your settings, and then you can go, you know, download uh, the color schemes and you can change them all. So, so your homework for this week is to install Git Bash, get it working, and have it working from Windows Terminal, and then explore uh, the appearance settings in your Windows Terminal so that you can get what you want, okay? Uh, and then and then we'll go from that. So, oh, hey, look, there's me looking. There's me, this is me, <laughs> I still have it here. This is me debugging uh, an application using Git Bash on Windows. I was like looking for the different world files and, and going through them all and everything, okay? So, so it's all Git Bash and that, and, and that's it. Um, I think, I think we're done One seventeen. Oh no, we have, we have, we have 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes left. So those are the things you want to get, uh, set up. I'm sure some of you are going to have questions about that. Uh, and we talked about visual studio code. Um, what else we need to talk about getting Docker desktop. So, uh, let's see. Apple hates freedom. Oh, we're going to talk about Z shell. Max switches Z shell because of the openness of bash. Yeah, that's pretty much true. Yeah, they switched to Z shell because of GPL v3. Period. We'll talk about that when we talk about shell, shells. Let's talk about Podman. And okay, so the other thing you need to install, and I feel really bad because I'm not going to install it. I'm just going to say it, talk about it. Is uh, and I'm actually having a thing here. Give me, give me a second. I'm, I'm kind of losing my mind here. I'm very slowly losing my mind. Don't worry about this. I'm SSHing into my my VM for right now. Team like say. All right. So you see, I got my stuff right where I left off. Okay. Um, markdown. We talked about that already. Uh, we are. I'm just trying to remind myself where we are. So, 
install a uh, terminal. We got that, that. So if you're, okay, let me just recap. If you're installing the terminal for windows, you need to install Git bash and windows terminal preview. Boom. If you're installing for Mac, you're installing iTerm2. Boom. That's it. In fact, on Mac, you don't even need to do it. You can just use the regular terminal if you want. There's no extra thing to install. Um, iTerm2, I suggest. Okay, so once you have those two things done, you should have a terminal. If you are if you have Linux, you're on your own. Ask questions in the Discord, and we'll talk to you about our different versions, but you've already picked a, a version of Linux. So, we're, you know, that's fine, but, you know, we're not going to... We're assuming you either have a Windows or Mac for now. And we talked on Wednesday about why I'm not going to go deep dive into why you should be... If you want to install Linux on your laptop, fine, you're on your own. It's not covered by the boost. The boost is about using the terminal. It's not about getting Linux on your laptop. If you want to do those things, which used to be a part of a boost earlier, uh, we're going to do those things in Home Lab Init, where we set up an entire lab and install it on all different kinds of hardware and Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. But you'll already have the terminal skills necessary to do that, right? So the boost is focused on the terminal skills and the overview. All right, Podman. So let's now move then to Podman. Uh, and I've already covered this, so I'm just going to repeat what I already said on Wednesday. Go out to Podman Desktop and follow the installation instructions. Okay, uh, when you install Podman Desktop, it will prompt you and ask you to install WSL2. Uh, when it does that, say yes and follow along with those things. Now, maybe it doesn't work. Uh, the reason I can't take you through this is because every one of you is going to have a different Podman Desktop installation challenge. You're going to have different questions and different challenges. So it does not benefit everybody for me to cover every one of those edge cases here podman desktop works on mac it works on linux and it works on windows okay uh and i'm just going to repeat what i said on wednesday about why podman podman is the replacement in the industry for docker desktop which has become which was always proprietary software has fallen out of favor uh, if you want more strongly worded language with regard to this, you can read my, my private blog and Zettelkasten. Um, Pod, Podman has stepped up. Podman is a, a Red Hat umbrella project, but it is, is stepped up as the standard for the desktop these days. And it uses something called Kimu, uh, which is an emulator. Therefore, Podman can work on a Mac, a new Mac with the ARM chip or the old Macs with Intel. Okay. Uh, it uses the same technology that uh, Docker Desktop does. And as of 2023, it's stable. When, when Podman Desktop came out, uh, I was very disappointed. Uh, Rancher Desktop came out around the same time. They were all competing with Docker Desktop, and they kind of rushed it to market, and they, they were bad. I mean, they just did not work. And I can tell you from recent experience that Podman Desktop has really upped the game. It is really, really good uh, these days. Uh, so, uh, Docker desktop, some people are in the chat are saying Docker desktop is open source. Docker has never been open source. Uh, Docker community edition is, uh, is open. So in fact, this is such a big deal that major corporations, including the one I currently work for have abandoned Docker as a container runtime engine entirely. In fact, uh, Docker is considered something of a virus within our company now. If it's found anywhere, it's ripped out as soon as possible because they have violated the trust of the entire world by bait and switching enterprises and saying, I'm sorry, you have six months to, to decide if you want to pay us several million dollars for all those seats of people that are using our free desktop application, which was never free. It was always proprietary. And then this last year, Docker decided to not only that, but in the free Docker hub where you host containers, which we'll talk about, they decided to start charging open source projects for their their for hosting them. And so the entire open source world panicked and left. And if you don't believe me, go look at, uh, for example, one prominent example of this is, uh, uh, and I don't want to say Argo CD, it's the other one. Um, uh, Elasticsearch. 
also searches proprietary software, but they had some free stuff, right? They got it off of there right away, and now they host on their own. And GitHub has its own place to put containers. We haven't talked about containers yet, but GitHub has its own place. So the, the takeaway from this is don't use Docker for anything ever again. And, it, and it, it's a hot take, but it's really not. In, in 2023, that is not a hot take. Docker is dead. The original founders have left saying they're pursuing other things. They're making alternatives to Docker. They're making competitors to Docker. And the Docker company has floundered for years. And it's been, there's been a battle between the Linux community and the Docker community just for making money off of what was invented by the Linux community called the Linux Container Engine, LXC. And, and that has just blossomed into this you know, open disgust for the Docker company. Somebody from Docker is going to see this video and they're going to be upset. Sorry, I don't care. Uh, don't use Docker. Uh, VC money is the only reason it was ever popular. Yeah, I don't know. So, so use Podman Desktop now. With I was gun shy when I heard Podman was coming from Red Hat. No, we're not using the Docker CLI either. No, we're going to use the Podman CLI, which is 100% compatible with the Docker CLI that I am still learning myself, by the way. Uh, I made the switch to Podman last year, and, and I still uh, have that problem. Uh, call him out in public. How dare I call him out? Yeah. So Podman Desktop comes from another company that's like a love or hate relationship, and that's Red Hat. And we'll talk about Red Hat Linux later, but... Red Hat Linux is the premier uh, distribution on enterprise uh, hardware. I don't think there's any debating that at this point. There's pretty solid numbers on that. Um, but it, it, it's 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 they they have done more for the Linux community than Docker has. Let's just put it that way. And and they even though they're a proprietary company and they're in it for money and they do things that I don't agree with, uh, and they made systemd and all of that jazz they still are committed to the Linux community in ways that Docker is not. So sometimes it's a lesser of two evils, and that's kind of what Podman is. If you had come to me two years ago and asked me to use Podman, I would have laughed at you because I hated it. I hated the fact that Podman was this thing. And frankly, at that time, Docker was kind of open. I, I didn't even know that Docker was proprietary software until they pulled the plug and said, psych, can't use it unless you pay. Oh, unless you're a small-time person. But who wants to use it if they can't use it at work? I mean, how stupid can you be? I'm sorry. I just can't. I can't. All right. On to the next thing. So, so install, install. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's like, so install, please install Podman Desktop. The end. There are certain parts of the Docker interface that are, that are, but the problem is, is that the line gets really blurred all the time. Same with Community Edition, Antigen, and everything, right? Uh, and now you have Container D, which is ironically, con Container D is supported by Docker. Even It's like a sub-project of Docker, even though it's, they, they took Docker out of the name. It's really complicated. If you get into Kubernetes and container management and engines, I, I don't want to scare anybody. This is supposed to be for beginners. But it is, it's quite a rabbit hole, and there's a lot of competition there because there's a lot of money to be made in the container space. So let's talk about what a container is for a bit, and let's move on to the next um, to the next thing that we need to talk about. Okay, and we only have a few minutes left, and and we'll end here. So I think I'm just going to introduce this, and then next week uh, we will start with Podman. We'll actually so next week. Let me just let me, we only have three minutes, so let me just tell you this. So next week, this is what you have to have before next week, or you'll be lost. Okay, you have to have Podman Desktop installed. You have to be able to access the Podman Desktop using a terminal, preferably iTerm2 or a Windows Terminal Preview that you've installed. That's using Git Bash. Okay, that if you're on Windows. Uh, if you're on a Mac, um, you can get away with using the default Z shell for now. Um, if you want to go through the hassle of installing Bash uh, on a Mac, you can do that, and we'll help you in the chat. That's not going to be included in this boost. Uh, I mean, we, it probably should be. God, I just realized we're going to have to, because you're not going to be able to code. I think we have to figure out what the version of Bash is on on Mac these days. Yeah, because because if the if the I I don't even think the Macs come with Bash now. So if you're on a Mac here, I'm going to make some extra notes. It does come with it installed. What is the version though? 
It's really, really, really old bash, right? Is it even? It's not. It's like three. It's not even four or five. I have a feeling the Mac people are going to need to install Brew, and then they're going to need to install Bash. Yeah. But I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think Macs come with Brew by default. The default of Mac SH is not. But what is SH pointing to? It's all ZShell Max or ZShell now. Yeah. So, it's not. Yeah, you have to install Brew. Okay, so before we leave, uh, I forgot about this, and I, I, we need to make sure Mac people do this. Installing Brew. Okay, so Mac people, you know, I forgot you need more than just iTerm too. You need to go get Brew. Uh, Brew is the missing package matter for Mac. This is how you install things. Um, and so once you get iTerm two installed, right, or if you just want to use the terminal on Mac. You need to double click this and run this command. This is one of the very few commands you can run from the internet and feel safe. And I, I will stand by that. Okay. Normally I am telling you don't run commands, especially that runner's root, uh, from the internet. Bad idea, right? Very bad idea. But in this case, you're more or less okay. What this does, just let me talk to you about this. This goes out to the internet, grabs this file. You can open the file and look at it if you want and then runs that file and installs brew. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, um, so as soon as you get brew installed under iTerm2, we'll say, then you're going to need to install bash. And you, the only thing you have to do is brew install bash and you should be good. Okay. So, uh, I didn't make a separate bullet point in our, things that for today to install bash but I, I realize i admitted that um because installing git bash on windows is a requirement and this is the equivalent on a mac do brew install bash i i was going to cover this uh when we went over bash scripting but i realized we're not even gonna be able to do navigation until you have the shell on there so so make sure you get that installed i'll update the 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 the, the summary of what we're doing today uh and i think we're going to go ahead and wrap up it's 131 so for next week, here's what you need to have done. Okay. So number one, let me go ahead and write them down. All right. So we'll write them down. Um, I need to put some sort of like a calendar or something to do dot MD. I'll, I'll clean this up later. So what do you have to have for, you know, for next week, for next week? So if you need help with these things, you know, look them up. Number one, you need to install uh, Bash. Either Git Bash uh, or Brew uh, plus, uh, okay, so install Bash. And that needs to be first because reasons. Actually, uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be first on Mac. Just install Bash. So install uh, git bash on windows uh, install um, brew and then brew install uh, bash on Mac okay and you can do that from the terminal without installing iterm2 uh, uh, install a better terminal application Okay, so in this case, it would be uh, install Windows Terminal Preview yeah, on a Mac, I mean on a Windows machine, on Windows, and on a Mac, you want to install uh, iTerm2 if you want. You can just use the one that's there. If you want to use the ones that are there, you can. I just don't think you will want to do that. Um, that's the other big part of that. And then, uh, okay, so you should already have um, created a GitHub account, uh, created a GitHub uh, account, and uh, let's see, uh, learned uh, basic markdown, and you uh, started uh, started taking notes uh, from GitHub GUI. And we spent most of the time on that today, but that's going to be the source of your, we talked about the RDBX method last week or last time we met. And 
writing down that stuff is going to solidify your learning. It's going to feel like a lot of extra work, but it's going to solidify your learning as you're going through it, particularly, you know, since we learn markdown. So make sure you do that. I need to get the better, uh, get that. And then, um, the last thing, should we actually render this so you can read it? Watch, I'm going to do my little trick here. Uh, TXT, sorry. There we go. We got our numbers. All right. So, uh, so six, we're going to go ahead and, uh, install, uh, Podman desktop. Okay. However you want to do that. Uh, with a WSL2 extension uh, if prompted, if you want to do that. So that is it. To say bang, bang. <laughs> uh, they don't want to use basic terminal. No, if they wanted to term colors, absolutely. No, no, they can't do that. They can't do the colors thing. They can't do a lot. Of, there's a lot of reasons to have a standard terminal. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. It, it's It's worth mentioning that the default terminal that comes with windows that has for decades is not standard it's not a standard ANSI compliant terminal and so it doesn't do things like color and underline and blink and all the fun things that you're going to want to do uh during you know and fishies all that stuff none of it will work unless you get the windows terminal preview which is why it was such a big deal when it came out some years ago, it made big, big headlines. It was all over in the conference and everything. So, so this is it. This is it for next week. Make sure you have these things done. And, um, and next week, what we're going to do is we're going to start with Podman, right? And we're going to expect you to have a terminal open that you want to use. In fact, I should probably put in here, um, uh, install a better terminal application, uh, uh, customize uh, themes and colors to your preferences and you're going to want to see other people's and stuff and people in the discord will share with you their preferences and themes files and you, you'll you just just become familiar with the application right uh, a lot of you can just is just kind of self you, you know I don't need to show you how to do it because you can just go figure it out yourself and you'll learn more on that um but if you do want a theme, if you want my theme, for example, uh, my theme is actually in my GitHub. So if you go into my DOB files, if somebody who wants my personal theme uh, is under, where did I put it? I thought I put it under install, install Mac. Uh, okay, so here's my iTerm2 preferences. You can download my rdbxrob.json file if you have a Mac. This is from GitHub. So if you go to GitHub rdbxrob slash dot, and then you look in the install Mac iTerm2 directory, you'll see my JSON file if you want to have the same as me. Uh, if you go into the Windows directory, you'll see uh, some stuff here that I have. Uh, I use Chocolatey too if you want to do that. We, I'm not going to get into it. Chocolatey is an alternative editor. Uh, I mean, installer. It's like brew for Mac. I mean, for Windows. But don't don't go down the Windows package manager rabbit hole just yet. Uh, we're just we will when we when we do apt eventually. But I don't I don't want to get too distracted with that for right now. So here's my set. This is my actual settings file uh, that has all of my colors and how my panes are split and everything. Uh, I don't necessarily like that you have to download a settings file, but part of your homework is to find out where that file goes and then you can download that file and you can upload it into your Windows terminal and you'll get the exact same settings as me um, if, if that's what you want. So it's all better terminal application. It's all, uh, uh, I'll put here perhaps explore, uh, explore uh, VS code a bit. Uh, to see as well. VS Code is such a prominent tool out there that not mentioning it uh, while we're talking about terminals and places to do work, even though we're not going to use it a lot for coding, would be a mistake, right? Because the entire world uses VS Code right now instead of Vim. You can use Vim for VS Code, and I want to demonstrate that. So, you know, for extra credit, go ahead and install VS Code and start playing with using the terminal from VS Code specifically. And that's it. That's it for today. Um, it's been really fun. Hopefully you guys can, uh, y'all, uh, I should say, um, can make sense of, of this crazy video. 
uh, you can stop it and go back. Uh, if you're going to do, we're going to just use Ubuntu server. That's, we're not going to do any of that till next week. Okay. So I, I don't, if, if you want to start going ahead and playing around with Podman desktop, you can do that, but we will be working from Podman server. So this is the Podman application. What you, you'll know that it's working when you have it here. Uh, and you can, if you want to read ahead about Podman, you can start exploring about that. Uh, um, and I'm going to put here, uh, you could say, um, uh, start exploring, uh, the Podman uh, command from the terminal. Cause we're going to be living in that. And that's going to be what we're going to do next week. So if you want to go ahead, you can do that, but we're going to do things like Podman, uh, dash, uh, it, dash RM. I think you have to do that in a different order. Uh, is it run? I have to go look at my command. I don't remember. I I don't do this every day, so I have to look it up. It's uh, run uh, Ubuntu. Is it dash it? The order is a little bit different, and that's one of the problems I have actually. From run it. There we go. All right, so this is why we're doing it. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I went from, well, I was using a virtual machine. That doesn't really count. Let me let me do a proper a sample of what we're going to do next week just to kind of get your appetite wet. Um, and then I got to go. All right, so here is an Xterm2 terminal. This, this, I know it looks like Linux. It is because it's Bash, right? Even though it's a bunch of Linux stuff. And I'm in my data file. Go back to my home directory, which is C users Rob, right? So, and, uh, but now I can do stuff like this. Podman, uh, I think I have Podman on here. Do I have it on here? Please let me have it on here. Yes, okay. So again, this is running under Windows. So I just do IT. Podman uh, run dash IT, because it's faster to remember. That's, that's interactive TTY, that's what it stands for. Uh, Ubuntu, uh, actually dash dash RM to remove it after, so it's not lingering. And we're going to run Ubuntu Linux. I think it's going to make me log in. Nope, there it is. So, as you can see, I'm logged into a Linux system from a Windows machine. And this is not Git Bash. It's a little deceptive because just by installing Git Bash, it looks like Linux, right? So, up here, a Rob at TV down here. That looks like I'm running Linux. I'm not. I'm running the Bash shell a binary that's been compiled to run on Windows. So I'm still in Windows right here, even though it doesn't look like it. Okay. In fact, this command that I just did, let me prove it to you. Uh, if I was to do PowerShell, let's do a PowerShell. All right. If I was to do a command prompt even, or just Windows PowerShell, I can still use, so I can have Windows, and then I can get Linux right away by doing Podman. I should be able to do, I haven't done this in a long time, so we'll try it. So run it dash dash RM. Uh, Ubuntu, right? And as you can see, it's the same exact thing. But what I'm trying to tell you is that whether you're using Git Bash, which is Bash on Windows, which looks like Linux, or you're using actual PowerShell, or you're using a command prompt, it does not matter. It's all the same. Here we go. Here's a good old fashioned Windows command prompt, right? Podman, let's test it and make sure it runs so I'm not lying to you. Uh, interactive TTY, which we'll talk about next week. Uh, remove because I don't want to waste it. And then we run it and boom, I, there we go. I've got three different Linux machines. Okay, so I've got, see how they have different numbers? Because they've all been given different, they've all been cited different, different names and stuff. And these are 100% Linux, the Linux Ubuntu servers, the kind you would encounter on Amazon or Azure or, or, or wherever. And, um, and you can go ahead and use that. And, and then, I mean, this is legitimately, and the other reason we're going to use containers is because then you can mess things up and go back and redo them. And uh, you can practice doing things like installing software on them. So if you do apt install, it's going to like, I don't know what to say. There's no, oh, we're already root apt install. We're going to learn about doing apt install. Try to apt install, you know, be, it's so apt update. And it's going to go get all the software from Ubuntu. This is stuff we're all going to do next week. Okay. Yeah, if you break it, you're not breaking your machine. And then we can see apt. Uh, now we can do apt install them, which is what we're going to be doing. And we're going to talk about what that is. All of these commands are exactly the same commands you would execute 
on a Linux machine if you installed it on your own hardware or if you had remotely logged into a server. Uh, which ironically, we're not going to really cover very well. We do need to cover that, but you don't need SSH here because you just use a container and now you've got a connection to it. So I, that's interesting. I'm going to have to make a way to work in SSH because it's so important that you learn it, uh, even though these servers don't really have SSH on them because you can just execute right into them. So now I'm exited. Now here's what's funny. Remember that server that I just did? It doesn't exist anymore. And we're going to, this is, this is all next week. So I'm, this is just kind of a, Hopefully this will watch your palate for next week and we're going to be doing nothing but 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 stuff like this. And we're going to talk about how to use the same container over again. We're going to talk about how to use different containers. We're going to talk about what a container is, of course. And and the rest of the boost is going to be involving using a container. OK, uh, because you haven't you need to do you need to do if you can't use Vim, you need to make sure you do a um, uh, you need to do a, uh, an apt update and that'll go f get all the list of all the package uh, repos and then you can do an apt install them and it'll go on. Okay. Uh, when it starts shells, I'm thinking of putting some bash settings so that they don't get around every command. Probably. Yeah. If you do an apt install them and it says it's not there, that's because you need to update your apt repos. So you need to do apt update first and then apt install them. We'll cover that next week. All right. It's been fun, and I'm going to go. I'm going to go have a great Saturday. I'm going to try to put chapter headings in this video, too. I'm kind of behind on that. But if anybody wants to help me do chapter headings, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll see you in the Discord. Please go out there and help each other, and don't forget to do the homework. In fact, I'm going to make that our final window here so that we have it up. So here's the things. Make, we'll make this the thumbnail. Bye. Do, 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 do. do we have music? What kind of music do we have? Yeah, we do have music. Okay, bye.